Troy, it's great to see you again. Good to see you, Steve. Thanks for having me on. Well, I am looking forward to this conversation. So I first became familiar with you through Twitter and saw that you were making some interesting tweets. And, and then I discovered that you live in the Portland area and I just happened to be visiting Portland around Thanksgiving. And there just happened to be a Bitcoin meetup that I think Dennis Porter was one of the hosts of that. Maybe you were one of the hosts as well. And so got a chance to meet you in person and decided it would be great to have you on the podcast. You also happen to be a professor at Reed College, and I love talking to professors, philosophers in particular, which is which is what you you teach. So tell me a little bit more about your background, who you are, and then we're going to dig into your Bitcoin story. And we've got a lot of uh, fun and interesting things we're going to be chatting about here. So tell me a little bit about who Tory Cross is. All right. Well, yeah. Thanks for having me on, Steve. Uh, I, I discovered you through actually hearing you interview another philosopher, Andrew Bailey, on your uh, podcast. And um, I, I think it's so refreshing, unusual, and, and um, interesting that, that uh, an advisor to financial advisors would talk to philosophers. I don't think, we're, I don't think that's uh, a normal thing, but it's a real, it's a real honor. And uh, it's, a, it's a really fruitful, I think, dialogue that you're having with us. Uh, yeah, who am I? Uh, yeah, I teach philosophy. I'm, I don't really teach philosophy of uh, money or social political philosophy or ethics, which is what you might expect given Bitcoin's um, profile. I teach uh, epistemology and metaphysics. That's the study of knowledge and the study of being. And most of what I do is kind of highly technical, analytic, contemporary philosophy. So there's very little uh, overlap with kind of what Bitcoiners might think of as philosophy, uh, what kind of philosophers appear on Bitcoin Twitter, uh, very little overlap between that and what I do. And probably if you try to read my papers, you're not gonna get them because <laughs> they're pitched at people who are already in deep. Um, but I, I, but I, I really like teaching philosophy and um, I teach a broad range of philosophy, uh, from history of philosophy uh, to I teach a class on color. What is what is color? A class on philosophy of religion, and I teach in the humanities program here at um, Reed College, which is an interdisciplinary introduction to the humanities, in which we teach uh, ancient Mediterranean, ancient Greece, ancient Rome, Persia, Egypt, and we do also contemporary. I should say contemporary 20th century um, cultural study. So I, I think of myself more broadly as, a, as an intellectual now. I wouldn't have said that before I came to read, but it's been a real privilege to teach alongside uh, colleagues across the discipline who've kind of opened my mind to more than analytic metaphysics and epistemology. Is that helpful? It is very helpful. And so my background is in finance and business. And so that's one of the reasons why I love talking to people like you, because I love having these deep down the rabbit hole type conversations. And it really challenges me and opens me up to a lot of different ideas that I might not have normally been exposed to. So this is a real pleasure for me to have conversations uh, with you. So let's talk about your Bitcoin journey, because you were okay. into Bitcoin early on. So tell me the story of of how you got involved in Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. Step one was, um, I think around 2007, 2000, 2007, 2008, uh, I was really into audio equipment. And I saw this really great deal on a set of speakers. And the person wanted to be paid in e-gold. And uh, I was like, what is e-gold? And why would you want to be paid in e-gold? And uh, you know, I just looked into it and I fell down the kind of e-gold rabbit hole. Like, first of all, you know, uh, uh, something that has the characteristics of gold, it's limited in supply, but which is electronically transmissible so we could make payments in it. And uh, yeah, this was prior to the 2008 crisis, but I was already a little bit curious about gold at that point. And I, I didn't get the speakers because I realized why they wanted the payment was because it was not reversible. And uh, that, you know, that sort of threw up a red flag and then I like looked into their address and it was like a phony address and it was all a scam. 
And then E Gold was shut down. Uh, it was centrally located somewhere in Central America. I can't remember. And it was used for a lot of criminal activity and the U.S. government basically forced it uh, closed. Then 2008, um, financial crisis happened. Um, that really caused me to read a bunch of books and look into the world of finance, which I had no idea really how it worked. Didn't really know anything about money. I still feel like I don't. But, you know, I read all the usual kind of books, not only about the financial crisis, but going back to the long term capital management collapse, started to see this uh, cycle of moral hazard and uh, rescues of too big to fail institutions. And um, also I did peer to peer lending during this time. I tried out these peer to peer lending platforms and I just recognized doing that what advantages a bank had over me. So I was primed when Bitcoin came along. I was primed both from my kind of disgust with the uh, inequities of the financial system, my little experience with eGold and why it failed because it was centralized. Um, and it was in 2011 when my uh, then girlfriend, now my wife, uh, showed me an article on Bitcoin. And it was towards the end of the school year, I think, May or something like that in the spring of 2011. And I just disappeared. I found the Bitcoin talk forum. I found the white paper by Satoshi. And, you know, I had the experience so many Bitcoiners have of reading this stuff, having a bunch of objections and one by one kind of working through the objections and realizing that it's a whole system that fits together and works together. And uh, I, I wasn't really drawn to it as an investment, uh, but more as an idea. Uh, this just struck me as a totally out of the box philosophical idea about what money is and property. And I just wanted to see it see whether it worked as a kind of experiment. I didn't think it would work. Um, and that led me to, to start to mine, to get some, to try to make payments, to, to do tipping and to buy some things. And um, so, yes, I, had to, I didn't know anything about uh, computers. <laughs> I had to like teach myself just even like Linux operating system. And so I could just start mining, uh, uh, but yeah, I had the experience that many of us had going down the rabbit hole, losing a tremendous amount of time. Uh, my my wife said I just disappeared into the basement for like two weeks and didn't emerge, except occasionally to say things that were incomprehensible. And then I would go back down. Uh, so, yeah, it, it was it was a fascinating discovery, uh, discovery and the community was interesting, but the protocol was just really, really interesting. The protocol itself, how it seemed to solve the problems of previous attempts to make electronic cash. Yeah, and my interest really in it was not in like investing or store value, it was really in uh, payments. How could it be used as a payment system? Yeah, I don't know, does that help? It does, well, it's very, a, a few interesting threads there that I wanna go down. Oh. One is you said it was your girlfriend, now wife, who introduced you to Bitcoin back in 2011. Tell me that story. <laughs> How did she get involved in Bitcoin? What was her exposure to it? Well, she didn't get involved, right? She was a, she just saw a story. It was like, hey, this is the kind of thing you would find interesting. And okay. then it was, she was done with it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, 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 sometimes I think this is what makes philosophers, uh, philosophers, it's sort of a Darwinian selection mechanism. We take up a question that most people would look at for like 10 seconds and decide eh, it's not worth it. <laughs> and we just don't stop thinking about it. So something like this class I'm teaching on color, what, what are colors? Um, I think most people are like, oh, that's interesting. You know, colors are wavelengths of light or they're the way things seem to you or they're probably like the features of the surfaces of objects and then they're done. A philosopher, it's like, okay, two years later, You've thought down every possibility. And so I, I get hung up on things. Um, the physicist Neil deGrasse Tyson kind of warns about this to physicists, like, don't go down the philosophy, don't go down the philosophy rabbit hole. So you'll get stuck there and never produce any meaningful physics, right? 
and, and, and I think he's totally right. Uh, I think physicists should be very careful about coming down. Anyone should be very careful about going down philosophical rabbit holes. You can get stuck there. But it's also like, it's like a search strategy. If you're the kind of person who thinks longer than you should think about certain questions, you might find something um, really worthwhile that you wouldn't find unless you spend a lot of time on a question that, that ordinarily wouldn't merit much time, right? So that was, I mean, she just knew I was like that <laughs> and sent me sent me on on the on the mission <laughs> and uh and that's yeah, one of the things like, that kind of like not into bitcoin although i have to say my wife is an amazing person because there's another part to the story which is that i did acquire what is now a significant amount of bitcoin just not a significant amount at the time and i made a bunch of purchases and uh it was difficult to get bitcoin back at the time i think the first bitcoin i got i i went through some weird it, exchanges through like World of Warcraft, had to had to sign up for a World of Warcraft account and then go go inside the game and go to some exchange, get some other currency and then go to some other account and trade that. It was just like, it was a, it was an incredible like journey to actually get it unless you wired money to Japan. And anyway, I acquired a significant amount of Bitcoin through mining uh, and, and buying it just just to play with it um and i bought a lot of things and most uh, most regrettably i bought a lot of socks there was an alpaca farmer in new hampshire i've got the socks on you know they're right here i mean this is one one pair those are the socks. those are the most expensive socks in the world right now right definitely uh i bought them on many occasions and i bought probably a couple dozen pairs gave them as gifts but i still have a drawer full at home uh they were five bitcoins each um I think that was my average. I think I got some for maybe three. I got some for maybe six or seven, but there's an alpaca farmer in New Hampshire who is, if he's held his Bitcoin, extremely wealthy. Uh, in large part, just due to me. Uh, but, but it was a lot of us bought, bought these things. So, uh, so I have to give credit to my wife. Uh, although, I have, although I bought goods and I tipped people and I gave my Bitcoin away and I paid for travel with Bitcoin. Used to, Expedia used to accept Bitcoin, so I paid for all my academic travel with it. Uh, you know, she never gave me a hard time about losing millions and millions of dollars. So, uh, so kudos to her. <laughs> yeah, and I want to touch on that. And I just, and I want to ask you what, what you learned about all, all the wealth you could have had. So, so let's just kind of put a pin in that for a second. But another question that I want to ask, and I've asked other guests this because I'm very interested in the answer, which is, what is it that you think, and you touched on this a bit, but what primed you that when you were exposed to Bitcoin, your 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 girlfriend, now wife, sends you this article, hey, I think you might find an interest in this. You go down the rabbit hole, but she didn't. So what was it about you? Was it your upbringing? Was it your natural curiosity where you said, hey, this is fascinating. I'm going to keep researching this. Whereas another person, and I'll put myself in this camp, I was aware of Bitcoin way back in the early days, but I didn't do anything back in the early days. <laughs> A lot of other people did. And of course, everybody can say that. But I'm just curious, you know, for you, what was it about you, your thinking that said, hey, I'm actually going to do something about this? Because I would have never done all the work that you did, the you know World of Warcraft or whatever that was, um, <laughs> you know, I would not I would not have made that effort to get that. But you did. So what is it about you? Um, I I think it I think you've already said it. It, it. I am a generally very curious person, and that's what led me to philosophy. Um, also, I just think that this idea. Um, it is one of the greatest ideas I've ever encountered. And uh, it's just, it's just absolutely ingenious. So as soon as I got beyond the initial level, layer of curiosity, uh, it was just appreciation for a beautiful idea, which is what, I, I guess that's what I live for. <laughs> so, I mean, different people are moved by different things to, to uh, you know, what gets you out of bed in the morning? What, what motivates you? And for me, really, there's a, 
certain kind of pleasure that comes from appreciating a great idea. It's, it's even better when you're the one who has it, of course, but it can be an even a, a great idea that's showing you why you're wrong. It still gives you intense pleasure to learn why you're wrong in a surprising way. And I think this is what drives, you know, mathematicians. I'm just not gifted as a mathematician. You know, I think it's what drives musicians um, finding I'm a big, I'm a big fan of box music, play box music myself. He's a problem solver and uh, he's constantly coming up with these ingenious, beautiful, simple solutions. Uh, and so I think it's just a simple appreciation for that beauty in the solution. And uh, Satoshi brought together so many elements in Bitcoin, right? There's the math that underlies it, of course, these one way functions, the, uh, the you know, the, the crypto cryptography underlying it that is used throughout the protocol. Then there's the issuance schedule, the difficulty adjustment that uh, assures that block times are going to be every 10 minutes or so. There's, of course, proof of work, which is the key, which prevents double spending. And, you know, so that kind of ties, weirdly ties mathematics to physics and to thermodynamics. It just requires energy to search for a winning number and mine a block. And uh, so it required a kind of <laughs> a, a awareness of the physical realm as well as these mathematical insights. And then of course the social, uh, the, the implicit game theory or whatever, the set of incentives that Satoshi is harnessing with the protocol. Um, you know, the selfishness which drives people to uh, hold the, the token, but also the selfishness which drives people to uh, mine honestly rather than join a 51% attack because it pays more to mine honestly than to, uh, than to attack the blockchain, right? So all this, like he had to be aware of this entire system of incentives. Uh, and, and, and as well, he had to be able to shrug off uh, standard orthodox economic thinking, which doesn't really have a place for anything like Bitcoin. And uh, which gave most people, I mean, your question about like what drew me into it. So, some of it, honestly, is ignorance. Some of why I found this, this protocol so fascinating and promising because what I didn't know, what I, what I wasn't educated in, right? Because there's a list, there's a long, pretty long list of Nobel Prize winning economists who not only missed the idea uh, initially when they became aware of it, but are still missing it. You're, you're, you're well ahead of, of most leading economists in grasping this, right? Most you're not talking not, about Paul Krugman, are you? I, I mean, that's one on the list, right? It's one, but not the only one. Definitely Paul Krugman, right? And what's interesting is that, I mean, I think finance people were quicker to get this than the economists because they respond to markets, whereas economists had the luxury of not responding to markets. <laughs> and, you know what I mean? They could just, like, like, just say like, yeah, it's still irrational. It's still worth zero. You know, it's still nothing. But to, to me, the discipline of economics here missed uh not only did they you know miss the 2008 crisis which a lot of people have taken them to task for but they missed the rise of a three trillion dollar asset class and uh i think that's a big miss uh i think that's a big miss there's one way of thinking about economics where it's like they have no business making those kinds of predictions or pronouncements and if they want to stay in the realm of the pure that's fine uh but you can also think of it as a as a as, a, as an empirical discipline so uh, yeah, part of it was I was curious enough and I appreciated the genius and the interdisciplinary, completely out of the box thinking uh, of this idea. And some of it was that I wasn't trained in ways that would shut me off from seeing, seeing it, right? And, and that's been just kind of the, the surprise of, the, of this Bitcoin phenomenon is who's not getting it and why they're not getting it as much as who's getting it. And it was like, who was on the Bitcoin talk forums at that time? Uh, who was I talking to? It was, because um, I was also, I'm not giving away my name on there, but I was pretty active on the Bitcoin talk forums. And then I was very active on um, Reddit, our Bitcoin once that started, the conversation moved there. 
it was an interesting collection of people. There were, uh, there were hardcore people who really deeply understood the protocol and were tweaking it, the really knowledgeable people. Uh, there were hardcore libertarians who saw it as a pathway to libertarian you know, utopia. Then there were just like a bunch of young, I don't know how to describe them. I mean, like a young mob of uh, crazy people. <laughs> you know, um, they're just kind of half cocked. I sort of like the the ancestors of uh, Wall Street bets population, right? They, they were uh, looking to make a buck, but they were also just wide open, very young, uh, somewhat technically inclined. Uh, miscreants, you know, there were a bunch of miscreants. And uh, that so would was you put also, yourself would you would you put yourself in one of those categories? Uh, no, none of them, none of them. <laughs> I, I didn't identify with I'm not a libertarian. I didn't identify with that. I, I wasn't a degen looking to make ridiculous bets. Um, I, I was fascinated by the idea. And I also wasn't very knowledgeable deeply about cryptography or the protocol, right? So I was none of those things. Uh, but but certainly part of the fun of being in this community was seeing this wide open creative alternative to the way that academia works. You know, there was no certification of ability. Anybody could speak. I know this sounds in a way it's sort of trite because this is just the internet, but at the time it was striking to me that you have people who are very knowledgeable mathematicians, computer scientists, like you know, essentially arguing with teenagers <laughs> who, who may know nothing at all, or whatever, or people would answer a post of mine, it would be like Mike Hearn or Andreas Antonopoulos or really, you know what I mean? People who were really sm smart and into this. And I, it, it was incredibly, that was part of the fascination too. A new way of knowing, a new way of discovering and fighting, a new kind of community with its upside and its downside. But right. it was refreshingly different from the hidebound academy, which was completely missing the boat here. And when I did bring up Bitcoin to my colleagues, you know, it, it just, and I didn't bring it up for two years in 2013. I mean, I just got, I got Snickers, right? It was like Bitcoin. It, it, it is already branded as this sort of, you know, magical internet money for criminals. Uh, people say, I didn't know you were into drugs, Troy. And I'm like, I'm, I'm not, in, I don't do drugs. Uh, but uh, they just had it pegged, right? Uh, uh, well, you should sell it as soon as possible. Uh, and I yeah, have which to say, and that, you, and that, sorry, you know, that brings up, well, that brings up, a, you know, an, another whole interesting point we could do a separate podcast on, which is what are the belief systems that make people just totally disregard anything new. So like you said, there's a lot of smart people that saw Bitcoin in the early days, but just totally dismissed it. And some of them, like you said, they still dismiss it to this day. So either they still believe it's nothing or they realize, yeah, it's probably something, but I just can't admit that I'm wrong. And so I want to just keep believing this thing that it's it, that it's nothing, so I don't have to admit that I was wrong. So anyway, so that again, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah, I'll but just I do. Say there's, I a, there's a great there's a great piece by um, I don't know his real name, Croesus, on Twitter about uh, why the yuppie elite missed Bitcoin, and I think it's super insightful. There's an element of that not wanting to admit you're wrong, uh, but there's also an element of not needing. To admit you're wrong because you're very well served by the existing system and part right. of this miscreant culture that i was seeing on bitcoin talk forum was people who were outside the system you know it, it, it's not like the young uh, goldman analysts had time to be in doing this or needed to do it they, they were very well served by the current financial system whereas yeah the people who came i think flocked to bitcoin early on some of them did need to route around the law uh, because, of course, there was a huge uh, drug market on the Silk Road. Um, and, and Bitcoin still is this, it serves people on the margins of society. So if you look at what, you know, it, it serves people who don't have access to the to the financial system and need to make cross-border payments, who need an uncensorable payment system, who need to store value against a depreciating currency. 
and and so the people who don't need that don't need to see its function because they're well served by the existing system. It's almost like a litmus test of how well positioned you are until recently. Yeah, and I think that's such a good point. And here in the U.S., I mean, most of us um, don't have quote a need for Bitcoin like people do in in other countries where they have civil wars and they have dictators and. They have people that confiscate your assets and that sort of thing. So for the most part, we don't experience that here in the U.S., uh, yet we do have surprisingly some pretty pretty high adoption here. Um, I do want to get back to, I'm going to call it the philosophy of regret. And you may not have any regret, but you did mention that at one point you had, uh, maybe over time, what would today be considered millions and millions worth of dollars worth of Bitcoin. So tell me how that makes you feel that you don't still have that and that you have socks worth $250,000. <laughs> uh, what, what have you learned from, from you know, that that slipped through your hands? Yeah, it's a great question. And, um, and the truth is it's hard to know. It's hard to know yourself. It's hard to know the true answer to that question and what what's rationalization, you know, <laughs> but uh, I've never lost sleep over those decisions. I find them comical. I find them hilarious. Uh, maybe that's my way of coping with it. Uh, but also I, when I got into Bitcoin, I wasn't married. I, I have two kids now, um, five and eight years old. And uh, I, spent a lot of Bitcoin during that period for my wife to go to graduate school uh, because also having kids is expensive. I bought a home uh, and I look at my, my, my kids, I spend time with them and there's no amount of money, a Bitcoin wealth, anything that I would trade for this time I have with my children and my family. And uh, it does, it really has taught me, I think, being almost wealthy, but not wealthy, uh, what, what I truly value and, uh, and, and what's worthwhile to me. I would love to be super wealthy. Uh, it'd be great. I would take it, but I would not trade it for what I have at all. And I have what I need in life. Uh, and I think the discovery of uh, the non-regret of losing that Bitcoin. I mean, I regret it, but in this sort of trivial sense that I wish I wish obviously I'd held on to some more Bitcoin than I did. Uh, but the, the discovery of non-regrets let me know how how much I, I really value value. And it's nothing, it's nothing surprising, right? It's nothing that requires a philosopher to say it. It's very trite, ordinary common wisdom, health, uh, time with loved ones, but it's something else to realize it when you look back at, you know, I recently lo loaded up my, my original Bitcoin core, Bitcoin wallet, right? And it's, as it's loading the history of the blockchain, it's, it's loading the history of my transactions. <laughs> and I'm watching all this Bitcoin, like the, the sum flow in, into my account and then, and then uh, gradually like dissipate into, into nothing. And, uh, and, and that was quite an experience, you know, it, you're, you're, it, 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 I did lose my breath uh, for, for, for a moment there. But, but at the same time, my kids are running around me and they won't let me concentrate. And I'm just thinking like, yeah, this is way better. I mean, it's way better. There's no, it's not even close. It's not even on a scale, right? right. Uh, and, what, and yeah, I think, I think a lot of people are consumed by regret. Um, I had a student once a few years, decades ago, who said that she just didn't understand regret and why anyone has it. And I was like, what? You got to understand regret. She was like, no, if you've done something wrong, just fix it. Just make it better. You know, the regrets doesn't help you. And uh, it's like, I didn't have anything to say in response. I still don't have anything to say in response. Uh, I think particularly with money, move on. And in a, way, in a way, like everybody has the same, everybody had the same opportunity that I had at the time. Uh, Anybody could have gotten rich on Bitcoin at the time. I got closer to getting rich. I don't really understand why that's worse, right? <laughs> like, like if you, it's kind of like, it's kind of like the silver medal in the Olympics, right? Like we know that silver medalists don't feel great about their silver medal. 
but I've never been in an Olympic event at all. Why don't I feel the same regret, right? So it's, it's kind of, it's kind of like that. It's a nonsense emotion once you unpack it. it. Doesn't serve a function, and everybody else should also be feeling it to an even greater degree. Uh, I'm really gratified by what Bitcoin has become. The fact that we're talking about it, the fact that people are looking into it, the fact that it's provided, it's made good on its promise of being free to money for people around the world. That is my wildest dream for Bitcoin. That's what I wanted for Bitcoin, not to get rich in the first place, but to see it play out as an experiment, see if it can actually improve people's lives. Yeah, and we're talking about regret here. I think of a couple of things about regret. One is, I think it can be a catalyst for doing better next time. And not in your specific example of, of Bitcoin, but if we do something that we do regret, I think reflecting on that can be this catalyst for, hey, what did I learn from that? And how can I do better next time? So I think there's some value there. A second one, and I think Jeff Bezos has been famous for, for making this popular is, is, and I don't know if he came up with this idea or not, but he calls it this regret minimization framework where he asks himself, let's say he's got some options on what he could do. And I think this was when he was starting Amazon and he was working for one of the hedge funds out East. And he said, there's this internet thing and I've got this idea Am I going to regret someday if I don't try it, doing it and do something with this? And he said that was sort of a catalyst for him to say, yep, I'm going to you know, move to Seattle and I'm going to start this bookstore, online bookstore idea, which of course became Amazon. So I think those are a, a couple examples about uh, the regret. But of course, if you let regret dominate your life, you're just going to drive yourself crazy. Um, yeah, but I think me... I, I agree. With, I agree with that. I just want to say I agree with both of those, and uh, and I think it's a kind of risk management. You know, thinking in your in your terms, uh, we, we think of re managing risk in terms of wealth, but you can think of managing risk in terms of uh, regret is a kind of uh, is created by a kind of risk gone wrong, right? And well, a risk of behavior too. I think it. Yeah. it it can um, be a catalyst for, um, you know, minimizing future behavior that you're not going to be proud of. One hundred percent. Sorry, I cut you off. Yeah. Well, it kind of along this line. So I'm I'm looking at your background, and you have a bike in the background, uh, and I know yeah. that you're a cyclist. And I think back in maybe 2009 you had a very serious bike accident. So tell me, tell me about that. Tell me about this idea of good pain and bad pain. And then tell me if there's a connection between this good pain and bad, cane, bad pain and Bitcoin. And what I mean by that is you were talking earlier about some of the people who were the early proponents of Bitcoin that they were maybe looking for something that they were not finding in the normal, I'll call it the normal society, air quotes, normal, that they saw Bitcoin as either a way out or a way through or some way to get past some, some bad pain that either they were experiencing or that maybe they foresaw was going to happen. So can you make any connection between the bike accident, good pain, bad pain, and maybe any connection to Bitcoin? Uh, that's interesting that you found that <laughs> about me online. Yeah. Um, yeah, I used to race bikes. I was never great at racing bikes, but I really loved it. And um, this particular accident wasn't in a race. It was someone who pulled out on Wisconsin Avenue in Washington, D.C. and did a U-turn in front of me out of a out of a parallel park spot. And I broke my C6 and C7 vertebrae, my neck, and uh, was stuck with some serious uh, pain for it actually it's still there, but it was serious for many months. And uh, yeah, I realized that part of why I love cycling is because it's because of the pain, actually, you push deep, and this goes for endurance sports generally, you know, you push deep into this pain space, and it eliminates everything else in your mind. And for someone like me, that it's a good thing. There's too much going on up there. And uh, 
it gives you incredible narrow focus and also just lets you kind of discover what you're capable of, who you are, and it improves you. Every, every one of these bouts of pain makes you stronger. And then I discovered that there's this other kind of pain that, you know, you're not putting yourself through it, but it's being imposed on you from without. You're not in control of when it starts and stops. And it kind of terrorizes you and fills you with fear because of that lack of control. And so there's just two radically different kinds of pain. Uh, and uh, the one I call good pain, the other is bad pain. And uh, yeah, I, I, you probably found this because of this lecture I gave in Humanities 110 at Reed College, right? And Chris Lydgate, who's the editor of Reed Magazine, wrote a beautiful story about this lecture. Uh, and the question was really about um, the, the kind of pain that we want to dish out as teachers. Uh, education is all about pain, but it's about the good kind of pain. It makes you stronger, that's self-imposed for the most part. You take it on voluntarily, make yourself learn, right? And uh, we want to kind of eliminate the bad pain in education which makes you feel helpless and it, it's not imposed by you, it's imposed on you. Uh, but yeah, this I've never made the connection to Bitcoin, but absolutely, I think that if you look at what Bitcoin does at its core, you have to look at the features of the protocol, right? It's censorship resistant, um, it's an open network, anybody can join it, anybody can make a payment and you can store value there and nobody can take that value away from you. People say it's property rights for everyone. I, I wouldn't really say it's property rights because that puts it in a framework of, of rights and property, uh, which Bitcoin is kind of completely outside of. It's just that if you have a private key, you control a certain amount of Bitcoin. And that control may not be a right you have, but it's your control, right? It may not be legal, but it's yours in some, uh, in some sense of control. Right. So, so for people who, yes, uh, who, for instance, are working a job where they're paid in a nominal wage, and uh, let's say it's bolivars, and the bolivars being depreciated, uh, inf inflated, uh, without their consent or ability to change, and their savings are worthless, that's bad pain, definitely, 100%. When you cannot get money to uh, dissident groups uh, in, say, Belarus or Nigeria, or you can't get money in Palestine, to survive uh, because the banks are excluding you, that's bad pain, 100%, yes. Uh, good pain, good pain here. Good pain is forcing yourself to learn something that's very foreign. It's, it's, it's amazing how people find Bitcoin as a protocol kind of difficult or alienating. It's, it is weird and different uh, as a system. Uh, pushing yourself through that is good pain. It's really fun to teach yourself a completely foreign system, but it's also painful if you're completely outside of it. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, that's excellent. I hadn't thought of that framework, but absolutely, Bitcoin is a salve to bad pain, and that's the sort that I think we should try to eliminate. Not pain in general. Pain is good. Right, and I, I think it's also tied into. I've seen a number of people on Twitter that when it comes to Bitcoin, they've said, I will die on this hill. <laughs> and I know there's been connections made between Bitcoin and religion, and you teach the philosophy of religion. So what, what strands can you connect here with religious fervor, with that same type of fervor and belief in Bitcoin, with someone who says, I will die on this hill? Is there any connection what are the connections between those or among those? Is there any connection to pain? Because dying on this hill, <laughs> um, you know, I, I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Oh, it's great. I mean, yeah, the, a lot of people have remarked on Bitcoin's sort of religiosity. And I don't know what I have to add to that, except to say, the Bitcoin community is really heterogeneous, right? The people are in it for different reasons. There are people who just want to make a buck. There are people who are like me, who are curious. Then there are the kind of true believers who really want to bring financial freedom to, uh, to the world and make this happen as a, as a, as a dream. And, uh, 
definitely every kind of element of religiosity is to be found in that group, in that subgroup. Um, and it's totally distinct from the protocol, which of course is just math. It's just, it's just a program, right? It doesn't have any religious bent whatsoever. Um, what's amazing about Bitcoin is it's both of these things. It's like this extreme religious movement. And if you go on Bitcoin Twitter, and I almost like hesitate to send your listeners there because it's such a motley crew and such a weird experience, you will find a really intense religion. You'll find the religion is, uh, it's, it's not just Bitcoin, but a lot of people who are deep into the Bitcoin religion or into other things uh, like avoiding seed oils and eating meat only and they're against the vaccination mandates and et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole bundle of things that come together at religion. I'm really not into most of those things myself. Uh, I don't have an opinion on seed oil. I haven't done the research, but I find it hilarious that these, these tenets of faith get bundled together with Bitcoin. Uh, in, in ways that I think are contingent. I think historically we're going to look back and see if Bitcoin succeeds. It succeeds because it's an open network. It's, it's being adopted in Vietnam, in India, in, uh, you know, in Nigeria, uh, in, uh, in Belarus, in Palestine. So it, it, it has, Bitcoin itself, in order to achieve adoption, has to be compatible with wildly different religious sentiments, real religious sentiments, political sentiments, you know, uh, cultural sentiments. Bitcoin must be independent of those things if it is to succeed. If it gets pinned down to the particular kind of religiosity, uh, which is common among the most fervent Bitcoin supporters right now, then it fails. Then it actually fails. I mean, it must shed that. Um, but there's kind of a core part of that commitment that must succeed if Bitcoin is to succeed. And that is the very basic elements of faith, I guess, something like an Apostles Creed, a Nicene Creed, right, that would go with Bitcoin. Um, it should be minimal. Um, and it should be acceptable to anyone buying into the network. And that has to be the key tenets of decentralization. Um, uh, no one can have control over the network. It becomes centralized and it's censorable. It, it's editable by by uh, whatever political powers that there are, right? Um, it's supply cap, I think, has got to be kind of part of that religion. 21 million coins, the issuance schedule. Uh, you know, the pseudonymity of it has the the fungibility of coins. Uh, I, I, I haven't identified all the elements of the faith. I should, I should, I should write them all down as a creed and say like, this is the minimal thing you need to be religious about. <laughs> In the sense that if you don't believe these tenets, then you're attacking Bitcoin or corrupting it rather than advancing it. And then anything else you believe in addition to that, it's like the Bitcoin plus religion. And let's hope it doesn't catch on too strongly because it will actually doom Bitcoin. And, and some of what I've done as a Bitcoiner and, on, on Twitter, I've just joined Twitter in June. I mean, I've been on Twitter longer, but I just started tweeting in June. Um, before then, I was just watching other people and I wasn't even watching Bitcoin accounts. A part of what drove me to Twitter was watching the Bitcoin narrative get kind of captured by a group of zealots who are willing to die on a hill and <laughs> but not necessarily the same hill I'm going to die on. <laughs> I mean, right. I, I, I'm just concerned about how it's becoming branded in ways that don't reflect its essence and which actually hamper its growth rather than advancing its growth. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, yeah, I, I, in the early days, I was, I was kind of a troll tweeting various kind of attack scenarios on Bitcoin or problems with Bitcoin back in the day on Bitcoin talk and on, on, on Reddit. And today, I think I'm similarly a little bit trollish in the sense that if I'm doing any good on Bitcoin Twitter, it's that I'm kind of warning people about not identifying a particular ideology with Bitcoin. I'm concerned about the kind of uh, politicization. And it's mostly Republican politicians who've taken up 
uh, the cause of Bitcoin, Cynthia Lummis, Ted Cruz. Uh, and, you know, I'm concerned that, and, and Democratic politicians have been the most outspoken opponents of Bitcoin, like Elizabeth Warren, most, most notoriously. Now Donald Trump, which gives me hope, I'm so glad that Trump opposes Bitcoin because it starts to tear away Bitcoin from that political identity, right? The fact that Trump- I, I think I think he's going to flip though. I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to distract our conversation, but I think what, and I know he just was on TV here recently with Maria Bartiromo, uh, right. uh, basically saying that he loves the dollar and, you know, Bitcoin's good. He didn't say Bitcoin, I guess, but he said crypto is going to explode. But I think if he decides to run for re-election, I think he's going to put his finger up and realize which way the wind is blowing, just what Ted Cruz did. So Ted Cruz, I think, realized that when you hear someone say, I will die on this hill, and when you hear people say, I am a single issue voter, that more and more Bitcoiners are becoming, then they will vote for the person who is pro-Bitcoin. And I think Ted Cruz has realized that, hey, I can gain a certain constituency that may ignore all the other nonsense that I do or say, because I'm pro Bitcoin, so I'm going to vote for you. I wouldn't be surprised to see Trump do the same thing if he decides to run for re-election. That he realizes, just like he does with the people who, um, you know, are big Second Amendment folks, just like people who are pro-life, uh, just like people who want conservative Supreme Court justices. He knows that if I am for all those things that I'm going to get a lot of single issue voters. And so I, I wouldn't be surprised if he becomes a Bitcoiner, if he decides to run for re-election, because he'll get a, a, you know, a fair number of votes with a very fast growing constituency. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all to see him flip. Um, I think it would be not a great thing for Bitcoin in the long term uh, for it to be mm -hmm. captured like that. I, I, have I to agree. Say, I have to say, like listening to Ted Cruz speak on the Senate floor, it's incredible. He was right on the money. And I, I I find it hard to admit that, but it was amazing listening to Ted Cruz. I guess I'm not a single issue voter in the sense that I, as much as I value Bitcoin and I think the, the, the values embedded in Bitcoin are absolutely crucial, you know, Running a country is <laughs> it's about more than that, and and then and, and there may be, and I think there are for me more important, even more important issues than Bitcoin. I'm going to keep chugging along with Bitcoin, but I really hope you know, there's a little group of us uh, progressives uh, in Bitcoin. I'm not even sure I call myself a progressive. I don't even know what it means anymore. Uh, I don't really have a coherent political identity. Uh, but I guess I lean in that direction and looking at my voting record, certainly. Uh, uh, there's a group of us trying to do this, to, to uh, get the message out that Bitcoin is not tied to a particular political identity. In particular, it's not tied to uh, li libertarianism. It's not uh, tied to right libertarianism. Um, I'm not the best person to lead that group, but maybe you'll have somebody from that, from that group on your show. Uh, you know, I'm not the best. Yeah, no, and I, group, I, 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 I think you're exactly right there that Bitcoin crosses all it should cross all per political persuasion. So it's not a right wing thing. It's not a libertarian thing. It's an all thing. And I think. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so, I mean, I'm definitely trying to give a voice to those folks who are really articulate in that. And that's one reason why I have you on the show here, because I think you're one of those folks who realizes that this is an all thing and that um, we, we need to find ways to communicate with people like Elizabeth Warren so that she can understand why this actually makes sense for what she believes. And we talked earlier about how she's grown up in a system that has uh, really been to her favor. She's profited mightily from the dollar system, from the political system that we have. And so it's gonna be really hard for her at her age to give that up and do something totally new. So I get that, but we've gotta figure out how can we connect with her in such a way 
that she's going to now come to her own conclusion that, oh, I get it. I get it. This is actually a good thing. But, you know, that's 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 maybe for another conversation. Yeah. I do no, want to just just want to say, you know, that I think Elizabeth Warren, she's very smart. She's been a critic of the banking system. She's in a way primed to see the benefits of Bitcoin. She hasn't seen it. And uh, I don't think she's going to see it. I kind of think Warren is maybe a lost cause. I I look to the younger Democratic leaders. I think uh, AOC very well might see it. She's been very guarded and neutral in her discussions of Bitcoin. You know, she said she doesn't hold any because she doesn't feel like she should while she's, she doesn't feel like she should hold any kind of investments while she's governing. And I appreciate that. But she's been very careful not to jump on that train. I think maybe she's reachable and other, and other uh, you know, younger Democrats are, are reachable. Yeah, I, I, I just hope it, I hope more people can see why Bitcoin isn't uh, aligned with party politics in the traditional sense. Um, really, the only thing Bitcoin is inconsistent with is authoritarianism. And I think authoritarianism, anti-authoritarianism should be common to the left and the right in America, because anti-authoritarianism is anti-American, right? So I think, it, I think Bitcoin is kind of American in this broad sense that is suspicious of centralized, top-down uh, exercise of power. Um, you know, that's part, part of America's founding identity is anti-monarchy. <laughs> so so I, I, I think it, it's political in that sense, but both parties should be on board with, uh, uh, with people being able to control their own property and make payments to whom they see fit. Um, uh, you know, just as just as both parties are okay with owning gold, for instance. Right. Yeah, and it should transcend politics. I know it's probably not going to, but it should. And you're probably right. I mean, Elizabeth Warren's probably a lost cause at this point, but AOC is a great example of someone who who definitely might come around to this. Um, you know, we're just we've been talking here about. Uh, you mentioned maybe a a creed, for example, of Bitcoin. Like these are kind of the core tenets of Bitcoin that you quote have to believe. Well, your 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 buddy and and a, a popular person in the Bitcoin space, Dennis Porter, uh, he just sent out a tweet here and he said, "I'm just going to read it here. Which are the three most important components of Bitcoin to you?" And he said, "I'll go first. And he said, "Proof of work, decentralization, and 21 million hard cap." And he got quite a few people that were responding to that. Well, Mike Alfred, he responded and he added a fourth and he said, the religious zeal of true believers. And, and then I responded to Mike and I said, yeah, I agree. That's a critical component. And I referenced the book by Eric Hoffer that you might be familiar with called The True Believer. And so I think, and we were talking about, I'll die on this hill. So just this belief in this system. And as we know, like the fiat system is a belief system that we have to have a huge number of people that believe that if I receive a dollar today, that tomorrow, next month, 10 years from now, I can give that dollar to someone else and it's still going to have some value. So that's a belief system. And, and to a, an extent, you know, Bitcoin is a belief system as well. So um, I don't know if there's I, anything I, to add to that. But yeah, uh, I mean, I just want to say, you know, you, this is not news to you, but, uh, you know, prices where supply meets demand. Where does supply, what determines supply? It's like the protocol. Um, it's, it's the block reward having every four years and the total of 21 million. That's all in, that's all in the supply side. That it, um, that's inelastic, the supply curve. The de demand side is all about belief. And it's nothing more than that. It's just the collective desire of everyone in the world who's interested in Bitcoin. And the price of Bitcoin is a measure of that desire uh, at any given time. And so it's, a, so, uh, and, and that desire is based on a belief that it will be worth something in the future and generally that it will be worth more in the future, right? So in that way, it's, it is, it has that in common with, with Ponzi schemes and um, with other sorts of non-productive investments, the economists are right. Bitcoin is not a 
productive investments and non-productive investments. So its value is created by the desire for it and its belief about its future value, which is really the future desire for it, right? <laughs> I mean, the belief about its future value is the future desire for it. So absolutely, you know, Mike Alfred is, is right. Uh, the, the religious zeal is what you're buying when you buy Bitcoin, really. I mean, you're buying into future zeal <laughs> for right. Bitcoin. Uh, and, and, and I think Bitcoiners are hesitant to admit that because it sounds kind of Ponzi-like, but as you say, it's the same for fiat, uh, really. And, and also it's a little more complicated because some of that desire is, is created by appreciation of Bitcoin's features. And those features are objective features of the protocol. So you'll have Bitcoiners say, oh, it's not, it's not desire. That demand is created by recognition of the features. And it's like, yeah, in part, we recognize those features, but still without any desire, those features would mean nothing. You know, you can have the, the and you can see this from NFTs. Every NFT is a one of one. So the, the supply is extremely limited. Uh, why aren't they all worth infinity? <laughs> because, um, uh, because they lack, because, they lack demand. Oh, why do they lack demand? Well, people don't believe in them. People do believe in some of them. That's why they're worth something, right? A anyway, I feel like the whole world is getting their mind around this, actually. <laughs> Bitcoin is helping right. to teach the world about value. Right. Well, and that's that's one of the things that I find so fascinating about Bitcoin. And you touched on this early on at the start of our conversation about just the the multidisciplinary aspect of it, where it touches so many areas. And one of the things just really related to what we're talking about here is that Bitcoin is what you want it to be. And what I mean by that is there are so many aspects to Bitcoin. There's so many vectors that someone can come into it and get interested in it. For some people, it's about number go up. It's about, oh, it's an investment. I think I can make more money on it. That's a vector to get in. For other people, it's you know censorship resistance. Okay, that's something I'm interested in. For other people, it's, uh, you know, I can, I can store this value. And if I have to leave in the middle of the night with only what I can carry with me, I can take that value with me. Um, so it's all these different things. And some people might criticize and say, well, if it's whatever you think it is, then it's really nothing, you know, but I think it's just the opposite, that that is part of the genius of the design of this thing is that it, it has so many different ways that someone can find value. And when we talk about price is simply where supply meets demand and where the market clears, I think it's all these different people that come in with all these different reasons why they want it. And to me, it's just a fascinating uh, you know, conglomeration of all these forces coming together to create a price and a system and a protocol that's just mind blowing. Yeah, so really well said. I mean, I've, that's part of the fascination is standing back from the thing itself and looking at the social phenomena, seeing the various reasons people love it, the various reasons people hate it. And it's almost like how can this be the same thing? <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> you, you know, how can it be, how can it be one thing that we're talking about? Like if you didn't know what Bitcoin was and you just saw the kind of, the kind of talk around it from, from major media to the finance world, to the political world, uh, to the crevices of Twitter, you'd be like, what the heck is this thing? Uh, it's like a big question mark because uh, it, it's got a weird set of friends and enemies and friends are friends for different reasons, and the enemies are enemies for different reasons. You know, Donald Trump and Elizabeth Warren united in hatred of Bitcoin, along with the the um, Who would communist have party. <laughs> I mean, along with the Communist Party of China, right? Uh, along with Erdogan, uh, like uh, what? Al along with Paul Krugman, uh, like what a, what a crazy s set of bedfellows. Uh, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's just, and, and, and for different, and that's because they oppose it for maybe for different uh, reasons. And the same goes for Bitcoiners. Uh, it's it's going to be, there's going to be many books written about this period of history that analyze the social phenomenon uh, of Bitcoin sort of reorganizing the way we think about 
politics and um, and people. Uh, it's a it's a new frame breaking uh, technology and world, and I'm not the person to unpack that as a philosopher. But it is striking. It's awesome. And, uh, well, and, I, th and you know, I, I think you're. Though. I think you're selling yourself short here. I think you are one of the people who can <laughs> unpack this just because of your background, your experience in the early days of it, your, the fact that you're highly educated, the fact that you're multidisciplinary with the philosophy background. So I think you're in a perfect position. So, so don't, don't think that you're not one of That's those high. people. Um, but I was, I was scratching here just a minute ago, trying to articulate how I think about this in, in two words, you, you really hit the nail on the head when you said social phenomenon. And I think that encapsulates in two words what I took about a minute to say, which just the social phenomenon of how this is all playing out in real time to me is just fascinating. And and I'm I'm happy that I'm alive at this time in the world history to be able to be a witness and a participant to what exactly. is happening here. And it's, that's, and that's part of actually, that's part of why I bought Bitcoin. It was almost like a memento of an historical moment. It's like I read the white paper and it was like, I just want to hold some of this, not because it's going to go up, but because well, I want um, like a, can you, you, know, I want, can you like show a, me your Bitcoin? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Like I, I want, I want to say I was there when it happened. And, and we've witnessed several moments. Like, like I was on this uh, Twitter spaces with Nick Carter when Bukele's, uh, legislation passed and Bukele came on the spaces and his brother, right? And it was just this feeling of like, hey, I was there when that happened, right? You're witnessing, uh, in witnessing that, in history. Spaces, right? Same, same kind of like uh, uh, something, this is weird, but owning Bitcoin at a particular moment in history is a weird way of, of uh, you know, it's kind of like when I traveled to um, uh, the ancient world and picked up, uh, you know, like a little shard of pottery at a, uh, you know, at, at, at the temple of Delphi. And it's like, you know, I'm going to take this shard of pottery home because it's, it's, it, it, it's anyway, Bitcoin as a shard of pottery from an ancient ruin or something. Anyway, I had that kind of a fetishistic collector impulse. Yeah. And I still feel it, right? Like we're living in these, what, what a timeline yesterday um, you had Bukele tweeting about his buying whatever 21 bitcoin on his phone naked according to him right like he's this pleb making these impulse buys on his phone like and then you have jack dorsey with his incredible uh series of tweets about web3 um and the the way it's sort of a cover for vc centralization and control I mean, it was like, what kind of timeline are we living? This is insane. I'm just, I'm just happy to be here and watch all this unfold. You know? Yeah, uh, it's amazing. It is, yeah. And Troy, there are so many things that I want to keep talking to you about, and I know we're already over our our time uh, that we've allocated. But if you're okay, I want to keep going here, and I'm probably going to have to have you back for round two because I know we're not going to get um, some of these other things that I want to touch on. But uh, uh, I do want to continue talking about philosophy. And what I want to do is I'm going to give you the names of two or three philosophers. And I'd like you to just very briefly describe what are they quote famous for, and then try and determine how you think they would feel about Bitcoin. Would they be pro Bitcoin? Would they be anti Bitcoin? So let's go way back. Let's start with Plato. So tell me about Plato. And do you think Plato would be someone who would be a fan of Bitcoin? Yeah, uh, this is such a great question. Um, such a great question. And it's really not something I've thought about, which is weird given that I've you know taught Plato. Um, Plato is most famous for his theory of forms, which is that the real things are eternal and unchanging, like numbers. There's also like the form of the good uh, which is goodness itself, not any particular good thing, but goodness itself, or the form of justice or the form of uh, beauty. Um, this is what's real, Plato thinks. And Plato is a mathematician. He thinks you have to study like 10 years of math before you can become a philosopher. Um, he thinks math is showing us what, what re 
reality is. And this world of senses, everything that's changing around us, that's the world of mere appearance. Um, this is what seems real, but it's not. And he has a, uh, an allegory for this that appears in the Republic, his most famous work, called The Allegory of the Cave. I'm sure you've heard of The Allegory of the Cave. Okay, so um, in, the, in the picture, uh, Plato has prisoners who are chained, um, staring at a wall. And on this wall are shadows cast by uh, people who are standing behind them with, with, with torches and who are kind of making like shadow puppets. And they think that what's cast on the wall by these shadow puppets is reality. The prisoners think that that's what's reality. It's these shadows on the wall. They don't realize they're mere shadows. Uh, but the prisoners themselves are, I mean, the guards themselves are also living in this cave, which only has a little bit of diffuse sunlight. And, you know, some escape the cave, leave the cave and look out onto the sun itself. And that's like the form of the good. Um, and that's what philosophy is. It's, it's this escape from what appears to be real, but is actually all changing to a direct perception of the good and the forms, the realm of forms. And uh, how we do this, Plato is not exactly clear. Plato himself writes these beautiful dialogues, um, including the Republic, but wrote a lot of dialogues. So they're actually like plays. Um, but he doesn't, the way he describes philosophy is not in terms of these dialogues in the plays, but actually some sort of mathematical proof like endeavor. So, you know, Plato's very, he's a mathematician, he's obsessed with his eternal realm. I think he would be utterly taken with the functions underlying Bitcoin's protocol, to be smitten by that, the mathematical aspect of it, the way you can have um, uh, a limited supply of Bitcoin would be fascinating, e e even though it's just numbers. Um, uh, the, the, the sheer, I guess, uh, size of the space of addresses and private keys that you must sort of search would have been awesome to him. Uh, but Plato also, in addition to being a mathematician and obsessed with the eternal, we, we often have, we have these sayings in Bitcoin, right? That Bitcoin is just math. Plato would love the just math part, but I think he would hate um, the other parts of the protocol uh, because this math rests on a social system of consensus, really. Um, it, 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 the, uh, the, the math is not pure math. Uh, the, the, even the solution to the Byzantine generals problem that Satoshi came up with is not a mathematical solution. It's a social solution. It has to do with the incentive of miners. And Plato wouldn't like that. Um, because it ultimately rests money on the human nature and human nature is being appetitive. Another thing that Plato does is he divides people into three kinds. There's the, the, the appetitive type who's ruled, well, there's three parts to the soul, he says. There's the, the appetites, foods, sex, pleasure of various kinds. There's the spirited part of the soul, which is courage, bravery, risk-taking. And then there's the reasoning part of the soul, which is like what you're engaged in when you're engaged in that. And uh, there are three types of people, depending on which part of the soul is dominant for Plato. So there's the part that, where the appetitive is dominant, you're dominated by your appetites. And this is most people. You're driven by your desires. And then there's the type who are driven and controlled by their, their love of honor, uh, their spirited part. And, and uh, then there's the type who are governed by uh, reason itself, governed by the love of wisdom. And Plato organizes his society, uh, his ideal society in, in the Republic uh, as one in which the people who love reason are in charge and the people who um, are spirited are the military, the guardians, and the, and the people who love reason are uh, kind of come through the military as well. And then there are the producers, the masses who are governed by appetites. Plato only allows the final class to have property, only the appetitive ruled classes get to have private property 
the guardians, the spirited ones, the, ph the philosopher kings, they don't get to own anything, right? But they do control control society. And he's he's an anti-democrat. Uh, he, he's, he's an autocrat. So I think Plato would not really, although, although he would, like, he allows the masses to have property and to trade, and they're the ones who want to get rich so they can get rich. The philosophers who love wisdom, they don't really need riches. It's not what they're into. The thing they're into doesn't really require wealth. Um, and, uh, and the spirited types, well, they're soldiers, uh, honor lovers, they also don't need wealth. They serve the state. So uh, he wouldn't like actually Bitcoin's, I think, bottom up qualities, that it rests on human nature, that it rests on human greed and appetite. Uh, and that it allows you to circumvent uh, governmental or central bank controls. Plato would be opposed to all of that. He's an, Plato himself was an aristocrat. He saw democracy go badly in Athens. He saw democracy lead to the death of his own teacher, Socrates. Socrates was put to death by the demos. So he's, he, he's looking for a better model of government, one in which his, his own mentor doesn't get you know, killed. <laughs> because of his anti-popular behavior needs. So he, he comes up with this very top-down system. So Plato both, I think, would and would would not like Bitcoin. The, the mathematician part of him would love it. The autocrat uh, would not love it. I mean, Plato fundamentally thinks there's this kind of person who's uncorruptible in their nature. They're, they're not only good, but they're just governed by reason. So they don't they control their own appetites. And for Plato, look, those people should be in charge. They're kind of like good bureaucrats. <laughs> they should run everything, uh, really run everything. And they tell lies and myths to the, the masses to keep them happy. And, you know, this is why uh, various people have thought Plato is really uh, responsible for behind, deeply behind uh, the excesses of communism because Plato basically authorizes it. If you're a good person, you can have those, those privileges of controlling others uh, to an extreme degree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but if everything was just run by pure logic, I mean, that's what algorithms are essentially, is you know, pre-programmed logic, and we've got the algorithm that makes the decisions for us. Well, we know what happens when Algorithm algorithms run things. It's a real problem. Um, all right. So, how about Aristotle? What are your thoughts on Aristotle? Yeah, it's hard to say, um, but Aristotle. Um, well, first of all, he he came he came up he made several breakthroughs about money itself. Like he just he he postulates the origins of money in solving a problem of exchange. Um, solving the problem of, of coincident wants. He also separates the value of money from the value of other things as having value only in exchange for other things, well, like can, not having well, value can, itself. Can, can I go back for a second? You said yeah. coincidence of wants. I mean, I typically associate that with Austrian economics. So does that go all the way back to Aristotle actually? Yeah, it's in, that's in Aristotle's politics. If I'm not mistaken that, uh, yeah, money has to exist in order to enable trade uh, for incommensurable goods. You know, you have something that I want, but I don't have anything you want. How do we proceed? Well, money solves that problem. Yeah, it's been a long time since I've looked it up. I didn't, but I think it's there in Aristotle. Yes. Okay. Um, there's actually several kind of, uh, several, I mean, I mean, I don't have it at the tip of my tongue, but several features of money that Aristotle specifies. I think the big one is just that it, it has value despite not being in, intrinsically useful for anything but exchanging for other things that have value. Uh, it's, 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 so it's, its sole utility is in exchange. And I mean, this kind of connects with what we were talking about earlier, the value of Bitcoin being like future desire for Bitcoin. It's the fact that you can exchange it for other things that gives it value, nothing in itself. But I think Aristotle would have been uh, more open to the value of Bitcoin than a lot of contemporary theorists <laughs> because he recognizes this pure exchange value. 
category. Uh, but also, you know, something you said about putting algorithms in charge, you know, doesn't end well. Um, Aristotle thinks of politics as sort of automating uh, the good society and the good life. Aristotle says that we come together for the sake of living to survive, we humans. But we stay together for the sake of living well, recognizes that in a city, we can build a better life for ourselves. In particular, uh, we specialize and trade. Um, we don't all have to labor. We create this leisure class. Uh, both Aristotle and Plato talk about all about leisure, but Aristotle in particular thinks of, uh, uh, well, the, the goal of life, I should step back. The goal of life is, is sort of achieving eudaimonia or, or happiness or fulfillment or excellence. And what that is, is just living an excellent life, or as I call it, living a kick-ass life, having a kick-ass existence. Um, and for, for Aristotle, that means activating the virtues, uh, what he calls virtues, which is things like courage and benevolence, um, moderation, uh, living the best possible life you could lead, and also intellectual contemplation. And it's, it's the city that makes this possible. Uh, it, it, it's impossible to live the good life on your, on your own, really. And, uh, and, and, and Aristotle sees the city governing it well, what he calls um, prudence or this, the skill of political science as sort of setting up mechanisms that automate as much as possible the, the, the aspects of the city that keep it running well. And you kind of, he, he would, I think, love the algorithmic nature of Bitcoin and its supply. Because um, unlike Plato, he recognizes that uh, human beings are fallible and are driven by desire to own. He, he says that Plato's propertyless society is ridiculous, that people want ownership. Plato also thinks that the children should be in common among the elites and that you shouldn't marry. It, it's, it's uh, and, and, you know, Aristotle's like, yeah, that's all that's unrealistic. That just doesn't fit with human nature. So Aristotle, I think, would appreciate automating an aspect of like issuance, aspects of central banking. Uh, so that we can sort of build towards the ideal state that allows us to do the activities of leisure. And that is uh, intellectual contemplation, friendship, uh, you know, uh, things that are intrinsically worthwhile, things that are intrinsically worthwhile. If, if, if we don't have to worry about governing constantly, <laughs> then we have time to do other stuff uh, that, that really matters. So I think Aristotle would be Wide open to wide open to the idea. The other thing is maybe you've seen the School of Athens painting with uh, by uh, by Raphael, uh, Plato pointing to the sky, uh, Aristotle pointing down. Um, Plato was was aiming for the ideal, the knowledge of the ideal. Aristotle was swimming with the fishes in Lesbos. He was out there in the tide pools looking at. Uh, animals. Uh, he was examining constitutions. He studied the world through the through the through his senses and through testimony rather than just pure thought. And I think Aristotle would be wide open to the reality of Bitcoin, the social phenomenon we were talking about earlier. This would fascinate Aristotle. Uh, you know, I, 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 like I said, some of why I came to Bitcoin was because of what I uh, didn't know. Um, I, I think like these debates about what Bitcoin is, is it, a, is it an asset, is it, is it money, is it currency? It has some of the features of money, but it's not a very good unit of account. Uh, I think the classification comes after the reality and not before it. We come up with these schemes of classification after we do a bunch of observation, not before. And I think, you know, Plato would be the economist who like doesn't get it because he would already have a definition of money and it doesn't fit that definition. <laughs> it's not productive. So he, he wouldn't like Aristotle's the one who would come up with a category that fits Bitcoin rather than trying to fit Bitcoin into a pre-existing category. Yeah. And I think 
maybe these two philosophers are a good example of what I was talking about earlier, where there's so many different avenues that you can get into Bitcoin. So we've got Plato, who you mentioned is more the math guy. And so he would like the 21 million hard cap. He might like the cryptography that's involved in it. So he might like it from that. Then you've got Aristotle, who is more in the social and understands that aspect. And he might get into it from there. So you take these two and they each might get into it for a different reason. And again, that's part of the genius of the design of this is that there's something in there for everybody. And again, some people will say that's such a negative, And I think that is such a positive why this thing is all inclusive, all encompassing. It's all things. <laughs> and, uh, and it's for everyone. Yeah, it's amazing. That, it's a great question you're asking. And, and um, I don't know that I've ad- adequately addressed it at all. I imagine there are many ways to, to answer that question. And that just proves your point, right? It's kind of this Rorschach test, not just for us, but it's a, it's a Rorschach test for anybody who preceded it, right? Because nobody really anticipated this thing. And so their philosophies are going to fit it imperfectly, if at all. Any, anyone we look to in the past, like how would they have thought of it? It's like uh, they, they didn't think of it exactly. <laughs> so it's always going to be this kind of slight misfit that tells us as much about them as it does about Bitcoin. Uh, yeah, it's a, I mean, it's kind of amazing. Like this space, this crypto space, I feel like I can't keep up with the other stuff that's going on in, in, in crypto. It, I know some some about it, but it's hard enough just to keep up with Bitcoin. And even within the Bitcoin space, there's advances in the protocol, like, uh, uh, you know, not just like Taproot and Schnorr, but, but in Lightning. Uh, and it's hard to stay on top of that. But then there's the broader social phenomenon that we're talking about. And it's very difficult to stay on top of that, right? So it's, 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 this, it's this incredible uh, burgeoning thing. Like you could stay on top of all of Bitcoin in 2011. It wasn't very hard <laughs> because it just wasn't that much to know. But now even Bitcoin is a lot to stay on top of precisely for the reasons that you're, you're pointing to. It's a social phenomenon. Uh, it's a growing technological phenomenon. And, and it's, a, it's a Rorschach test. It's almost interesting, sometimes not for its intrinsic features, but what it's showing us about ourselves uh, looking at it. Yeah, and you mentioned that Bitcoin doesn't fit into pre-existing categories. So as you're talking about Plato and Aristotle and saying, well, it doesn't quite fit exactly into what their frameworks were at the time. And in the financial markets, there's this idea that the stock market will climb the wall of worry, which which means it's going to continue to go up, even though there's always something to be worrying about in in the economy and in the world. And maybe to some extent, it's the same thing with Bitcoin in that you're always going to have your naysayers, but then you're also going to have your true believers. And it's the continuing tension of these two forces that is sort of creating this movement upward over time as the true believers have such a strong belief and that becomes a bigger and bigger contingent. And then you've still got these naysayers that it's that tension that I think is, you know, intention wants to release. And I think in this case, the tension that wants to be released is number go up because of the design of Bitcoin itself. That is the natural relief valve is for it to go up. Anyway, so no, that, no, this is awesome. I mean, I, I, it's a cool thought. And I mean, it's like uh, the price is really the measure of these two forces at any given time, right? The measure of the forces, not by personal minds, but by wealth backing those minds, you know, weighted minds weighted by wealth <laughs> and, um, and ability to, to, to exercise a decision because not everyone's able to buy Bitcoin or that historically has been difficult or not able to short it or not able to sell it, right? Which is awesome because you wade into this thing. And as you say, it's intense emotions um, on both sides. Intense, and this is itself kind of a mystery, like the depth of hatred for Bitcoin. Uh, uh, I mean, the the depth of love I kind of get because 
uh, there are people pumping their own bags and people like wealth. But the, the hate is harder to, to understand for me. But they're kind of, you know, ever, you know, even, even back in 2011, there were haters who's like kind of purpose in life is like hating on this protocol. And it's just intense. It's intense. Uh, they wish it death, like constantly. And uh, uh, a great mystery is like, why would you organize your life that way? Why would you organize your life around uh, a, a, a negative stance on an asset? <laughs> it's kind of a mystery, but it goes, it's a deep, like religious war. It's a kind of religious war. It's got that fervor. It's got that enthusiasm, right? On both sides. And then the price is like where the war is at, at any given moment. It's the front line. The price is the front line of this exactly. religious war. This is just wild. I mean, just wild. Yeah. And I, I, maybe one way to frame this is why some people just hate on it is this idea of useful delusions. And I did a podcast with uh, uh, Shankar Vedantam and we, he wrote a book called Useful Delusions. And the basic idea is why do people believe just crazy shit? I mean, stuff that is provably false, yet people still cling to these ideas, whether it's conspiracy theories and you know all kinds of nonsense. And he said that what we need to do is there there is this idea of a useful delusion, which means I'm going to believe this thing because it meets some need that I have. Now, maybe it's complete nonsense to, to me, like how in the world could you think that that is true? Well, what I need to understand is what is them believing in that idea? What need is that solving that they have? And I think we see a lot of this in politics, that there's all kinds of stuff that people will spout that I would say, tr trying to be discerning and looking at all the information and coming to a reasonable conclusion would say, that's just totally wrong. But then I have to step back and say, okay, how do they benefit by believing that? And it may be something as simple as, well, if I wanna be part of this particular tribe and this community, where I get social benefits, where I get acceptance, that I need to believe this idea, even though maybe in my heart of hearts, I'm like, yeah, I'm not so sure, but I'm just going to go along with it because I don't want to be the outcast. And we all know that being outcast from your group, from your tribe, from your community is like one of the, we talked about pain earlier. That's like some of the most pain that we can feel is being an outcast. So, um, I think there may be some of that. And so one of the things that I've, I've kind of come to appreciate over the years is if, if someone believes something that I think is like totally opposite of the truth, I'm trying to understand, I'm trying to have more empathy for like, okay, well, why do they believe that? What's in it for them to believe that? And maybe I can have a little more compassion for that belief. I still am probably not gonna agree with it, but at least I can understand where they're coming from. It's not that they're stupid, because a lot of these people are really smart people. So I don't know if you have any 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 thoughts on on that concept as well. Well, I, I just think those are very wise words. And I wish, um, I mean, I'll take them to heart for one. I need, you know, I agree with all that. I need it as a reminder. Um, I, I, I wish it were more widespread. And it's something you do learn repeatedly as a teacher, because I, I, everything you said describes what it's like to teach. Um, you know, you have people who believe things that appear to be delusional to you and you want to connect with them. Your goal is ultimately to see them grow. And you cannot do that without casting yourself into their perspective, however strange that is, you know? And it's something also you learn from, from the study of history, like this humanities class that I teach when, when, you, when you read people who are separated from you by millennia and by culture and language, um, it forces you radically outside of your own way of thinking. Otherwise, you're, you're you know, literally 90% of what they're saying is delusional. But, you know, it's, it's almost easier to do that when they're thousands of years away than when they're your neighbor. Or friend, you know what I mean, or political opponent, and you're like, "What? You have no excuse. You're not, you know, you're not in, 
you're not in ancient Persia. You're right here, right now. Come on. Uh, but it's you're right. It's it's there's sort of an illusion that you're in the same world when you're not. If your social circles are different, if your inputs are different, it, really your neighbor might be as distant as an ancient Persian in some respects from from you. Uh, you know, it, 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 you're in different worlds. And I, I, I just appreciate that. I really appreciate that comment. Uh, I, I, it's, it's, I'm just like everyone else, kind of scared by and feel somewhat helpless to see the, the political polarization of the country. And, um, and Bitcoin Twitter is actually a really interesting insight into it because here are people and Bitcoin, the Bitcoin world has always been this way for me. It's a space of people who are outside my social circles and whose political views are very different from the political views of my, my friends in, in the real world, <laughs> um, but who I completely agree with on Bitcoin. And, uh, you know, and I, 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 I just, I see the, I see how it happens. I, I, like, how do you get drawn into conspiracy theory? Well, when the experts are wrong about Bitcoin, and they're so egregiously wrong across a number of issues, whether that's Bitcoin in the environment, uh, uh, just how Bitcoin works, they're just wrong across a number of issues, factually wrong. And they're very established people, experts. Then you're like, well, do the experts in other areas get it wrong as well? Are they also hoodwinking me? Does it also benefit them to do so? And then you're off to the races because you, you can't trust these institutions of knowledge. Of course, I'm part of this institution of knowledge. And um, yeah, something I don't know if we get to talk about today, but I would like to talk about at some point is uh, Bitcoin and the environment. Um, you know, it was one of the things that, that it was the thing that made me stop mining back in 2011. I only mined for like a month. Uh, because I did this back of the envelope calculation about the emissions that would occur if Bitcoin had the market cap of gold, which was an insane thought back then. It's not an insane thought anymore. And um, at that time, it would have been just disastrous and made us overshoot any kind of emissions goals. And um, I stopped mining for that reason. I, uh, but now I see the issue is extremely complex. Uh, I think simple dismissals of Bitcoin along those lines are wrong and mistaken. And I see Bitcoiners reacting to those simplistic dismissals. And I'm right there with them. You know, I'm on the Bitcoiner side of this issue now, right? Uh, so yeah, it's weird. Uh, being on both sides, seeing how Bitcoin makes you question authority. And yet, yeah, I'm still in this world. I'm still an academic. Uh, I. Uh, you know, my brother-in-law is an atmospheric chemist who, um, you know, flies up in planes taking samples of uh, air and measuring it with a super sophisticated expensive device and whose colleagues are modeling the changes in the climate, right? I, I 100% trust that guy and everybody else I know in that field. Uh, I have no reason to think that they're pulling some giant scam on humanity, uh, tricking us into thinking there's a global crisis when there's not, right? But when I try to say that to Bitcoiners, it's like, yeah. And also the economists are all telling us that Bitcoin's worth zero, while uh, in fact, it's worth almost a trillion dollars. So what, you know, what credibility do you have? So I've, I've watched, yeah, political polarization that comes from the kind of a lack of that basic empathy and projection that you're talking about. And also the kind of conspiratorial thinking that Bitcoin prompts and I totally get why it prompts that thinking. It's kind of a, an epistemic uh, tragedy that these uh, sources of detailed technical knowledge, which we cannot all gain ourselves. I can't study vaccine, vaccines and the atmosphere and uh, uh, the the ecological systems that we depend on. I can't study all that stuff myself. I rely on a whole body of experts. We all do. Nobody can. It's just too hard. Um, so the trust on that, on that system is, is vital for our species to make wise and informed decisions. And um, 
that trust has been like fractured for a great number of people. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's this is partly my interest as an epistemologist. How do we repair that? And we repair that trust starting with the thing that you said, not with some fancy epistemology thing, but it starts with relationship and um, friendship. We first of all have to trust the human beings involved. <laughs> and, um, and that trust has been broken uh, at that level and it must be repaired at that level. Yeah, and this, um, I think oftentimes what we default to, like if we are having a conversation with someone and they just dismiss uh, global warming, for example, I think our natural reaction is, well, I'm just going to throw a whole bunch of facts and I'm air quoting here. I'm going to show all these facts about how the temperature has risen this amount over this number of years and and that's you know unprecedented in our recorded history and so on and so forth. Well, the reality is facts are not going to change anybody's mind because they've got their facts, I've got my facts, and their facts are more important than my facts. And so we're not going to be able to convince or change anybody's mind. I think that's the same thing with, with Bitcoin in that if we're trying to get other people to be more receptive to Bitcoin, whether it's an Elizabeth Warren, whether it's an AOC, uh, whether it's a Paul Krugman, um, giving them more facts is not going to do it because we're emotional creatures and we have to come to our own conclusions. We have to feel like it's our idea. And I think maybe a better approach is going to be the humanistic approach, first of all, that relationship. Well, what do we have in common? Let's begin with that. And I, I think that sort of starts to open up the door a little bit. But then I think it's also... Uh, being better storytellers. And I don't mean in a manipulative way, but more in a way to share stories that can connect us with our common humanity. And once people understand that I'm coming to you from a place of our common humanity and understanding, then I think people might be more receptive to seeing things a different way. And, and then once they're open to that, then maybe some of these facts might be a little more receptive to be received on their end. So uh, that's probably a whole nother conversation no, as well. Could, but If I can just say, I mean, the philosophers today work entirely in this realm of argumentation. You know, we have premises, we have conclusions, we reason from our premises to our conclusions. That's philosophy, right? It doesn't engage storytelling. It doesn't engage uh, relationship at all. It works entirely, ostensibly works entirely in, in a channel of facts. Uh, you reason from facts to other facts. That's philosophy. That's entirely the way philosophy is taught and done. Um, and, and in a way, what one way of putting your point is that the philosophy doesn't persuade anybody. And, and that's true. Um, and, and another way of putting your point is that there's a form of philosophy. We already talked about Plato earlier. You know, he wrote in dialogues. He wrote in dialogues. Uh, those dialogues were bestsellers of his day because they often featured like the who's who of Athens in them, and they were funny and uh, and in some ways tragic. And Plato, while he was this mathematician, the reason he's a great and well-known philosopher is no doubt the literary quality of those dialogues, which were about people and about relationships and about connecting with his opponents who appear as, as characters in his dialogues, right? And Plato, just to finish the cave metaphor, the philosophers go outside the cave and see the sun, according to Plato, the good. But then they return back into the cave and they tell the prisoners like, hey, there's this reality out there. Um, what you're looking at is just shadows, you know? Um, and when they return to the cave, nobody believes them. This was the experience of, of Socrates who, who was put to death. Nobody believes them. They're just like, what? And, and uh, I've thought about what is, does it mean to go back into the cave and how do you do it? And Plato himself does it for us in the dialogues. So he describes philosophy as this kind of mathematical proof like method of inquiry, kind of like science, how science is done. But he himself writes in dialogues. Why? Those stories. That's how he goes into the cave. 
tells stories. He connects with people in Athens. He seduces them into thinking in a certain way, not to agreeing with him, but he seduces them into the process of doing philosophy, or the process of real inquiry, not to, not to get them to a conclusion, but to get them on a path to thinking in a certain way, right? And uh, it, it, it's, uh, that's what it is to go back down into the cave for the philosopher. And uh, although philosophy itself, as it exists now, does not engage in this, broadly construed it must if it's to be effective yeah sorry this is maybe a different different topic for a different interviewer right but what really is philosophy what does it become it's become a like math science proof like thing but that's not how it began and that's not how you go back down that's not how philosophy must uh work if, if it's if it's to if it's to actually persuade anyone well, yeah, and I think it probably gets back to, well, what is the purpose of philosophy? Is it to help explain the world, the environment around us? Is it to try and influence people and persuade them to change their opinion about things? Um, you know, we, we talk, we're talking about storytelling. I mean, who was one of the greatest storytellers of all time? And I'm going to give you a hint here, at least in my opinion. Well, I'm going to say you, it's going to be Christ. Exactly. Yeah, I was going to, I was going to give you a hint, your, your philosophy <laughs> of religion. I mean, we're on the same page here. I mean, he told stories. He told parables. And here we are, you know, a billion, two billion Christians are still talking about him 2,000 years later. I mean, that's how you connect with people. Again, not manipulation. I want to be clear here. We don't want to use storytelling as a tool of manipulation, which it can be. And we've seen people in history who have become masters at that. That's not what I'm talking about here, but I'm talking for the good um, storytelling. And I think we all, you know, can, can stand to improve our storytelling. It's kind of amazing how many people have stepped up within the Bitcoin space and done this job for free. You know what I mean? I think uh, the narrative surrounding Bitcoin, this is a lot of what Bitcoin Twitter is about, is, is we've got something that, you know, as Satoshi said himself when he was explaining the protocol, like this is like nothing else. You know, you say it's a bloody hard thing to explain because um, there's nothing else like it, right? But a lot of the Bitcoin community has taken that up as a challenge. How do we come up with metaphors for what, what Bitcoin is and how it works and why it's valuable. And it's all free labor on people's parts, right? But it's beautiful storytelling uh, across the board. Uh, I can think of many, many examples, but you know, it's, it's kind of a joint, awesome joint endeavor. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's right. I, I think that's right. There's this, <laughs> in a way, Satoshi is the philosopher who I, I think he's the most influential philosopher of this century, maybe one of the one of the great philosophers uh, of this era, you know, he came up with the idea the protocol, and he started that storytelling. I, uh, he started with imagine it's like gold, but it's dull gray. And he started the comparison already to gold and tried to explain what it is and why it worked. But, uh, uh, but we've moved from this, from the idea, the the, the idea kind of in mathematical form in code to uh, the task of making it understandable to human minds, uh, which are not wired to think in terms of uh, anything like uh, anything like Bitcoin. You know, what, what it ultimately looks like is just this list of transactions uh, from one address to another and issuance. And that is nothing like, uh, we don't have stories about that. We don't have stories that tie into that, right? So the whole Bitcoin, anyway, the Bitcoin community has kind of crowdsourced this stage of uh, uh, myth-making. And I think myth-making in a good way and constantly challenging those myths too, where they kind of fall short. Is it digital energy? Is it digital property? You know, like these, all of the metaphors that get combined, it's, in, it's insane, I, I have a, thread, an early Twitter thread, where I just kind of listed the, what people have said when they say Bitcoin is, Bitcoin is dot, 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 right? And it's like, it's coming, it goes back to your Rorschach point. That list is like two dozen words long, you know, it's like so many different things. 
Yeah, and I think you're spot on when you mention that there are so many people in the Bitcoin community here that are telling great stories, that are writing stories. Uh, I'm going to say creating myths. I don't want to necessarily use the word myth because people will think, well, that means it's not true. But just using metaphor and using analogy to try and describe this thing that we call Bitcoin, because again, it doesn't fit into a pre-existing box. It doesn't fit into a pre-existing category. And that's one re reason why I think it's so hard for so many of us to wrap our ha hands around it because it's so many different things. Um, and that again is one of the reasons why it's endlessly fascinating because the more you learn about it, the more you realize what you don't know about it. <laughs> and it, it, it's just endless. Um, I know we've been going for almost two hours and I, you know, I can continue this the rest of the day, but I want to make sure, and you know, we'll probably have a part two here at some point as well, but I want to make sure, um, I know you've, you, you're working on a paper called Greening Bitcoin. And if you have the time, uh, I'd be happy to, to dig into that here a little bit and just the environmental impact of Bitcoin. Yeah, I'd love to. Well, this is a paper with, uh, Andrew Bailey and, um, and yeah, really, this is the thing that kind of got me started on Bitcoin Twitter. Um, started with uh, environmental concerns about Bitcoin, which I, as I said, I share myself. Um, Bitcoin's mining uses energy, large quantities of energy. And the production of that energy leads to emissions. So you can think of it's like CO2 emissions and other kinds of emissions. You can think of, of the emissions of Bitcoin as an externality of Bitcoin usage and Bitcoin holding, a negative externality. Right? Um, so the, the paper idea uh, that I would like to share, if I can, uh, is the bottom line is uh, it's a way to hold Bitcoin uh, that is carbon neutral, net carbon neutral, and to do so without buying carbon offsets, like without paying to plant trees or anything like that. But carbon neutral in the sense that your purchase of Bitcoin and your holding Bitcoin doesn't result in any net emissions of carbon, even though Bitcoin miners will process uh, blocks while you hold Bitcoin, you won't be responsible for any net carbon emissions. And uh, the way to the way that we we think about this is. Uh, First of all, by asking the question of how does owning Bitcoin lead to carbon emissions? Like what's the pathway? How does it, how does one cause the other? And the, the best way I have for thinking about this is uh, thinking about all of Bitcoin ownership and all of Bitcoin mining. So Bitcoin miners are paid in terms of the, they're paid by a block reward right now it's a 6.25 Bitcoins per block. That's about every 10 minutes. That's about 900 Bitcoins per day. And that's the sum total of all payment for mining. Ah, there's also fees, but fees are very, very small proportion of what miners get paid. But they get paid exclusively in Bitcoin and in terms of block reward and fees. Uh, and a total of you know 900 a day plus a little bit of fees. Um, okay, what makes those fees worthwhile? What makes that block reward worthwhile is the price of Bitcoin. If Bitcoin were worth nothing, then that, that block reward would be worth nothing. So the way that you cause mining and the way that I cause mining is by buying and holding Bitcoin. Not so much transacting in it because the fees are tiny. But when you buy and hold Bitcoin, you make the price of Bitcoin higher than it otherwise would be. Uh, and a way to think about this is just all of us who hold Bitcoin are responsible for all of the price of Bitcoin. And the way I think about it is your sort of personal responsibility for the price is your kind of percentage of the total amount of Bitcoin owned. And then um, all of the mining that happens happens because of all of the uh, because of the Bitcoin price, which is all of us owning it. So the total of Bitcoin revenue last year was something like $15 billion. 
That's how much mining happened because of us. And if you want to know how much mining happened because of you, you take your total percentage of Bitcoin owners, Bitcoin overall, and you take the same percentage of mining. So if you own 1% of Bitcoin, you're responsible for 1% of mining. That's 1% of that 15 billion in revenue. Uh, that's because of you, right? So that's that's the first step. How, how does holding cause mining? It, it causes mining by raising the price of Bitcoin and thereby raising the price, the value of the mining reward and the fees. And how much does your ownership cause in mining? Take your percentage of all Bitcoin. You are responsible for that same percentage of all mining. Okay, that's stage one. Now, how do you cancel that amount of emissions coming from that amount of mining? Uh, here's the interesting part of the proposal. Rather than buy an offset or something like that for the same amount of emissions, you can simply mine Bitcoin yourself, like with carbon neutral mining. And a very interesting feature of Bitcoin is it's a capped amount of issuance every day and every block. So if you win a block with carbon neutral mining, like say mining with hydro or mining with wind or mining uh, with nuclear, if you win a block with that uh, kind of mining, then carbon intensive forms of mining, say mining with coal, mining with natural gas, they don't win that block. Um, or another way of thinking about it is uh, there's kind of one giant you know, milkshake, which is the, the total block reward for, for the day. And when you add more hash rate to the network by mining yourself, it's like you're sticking another straw in the very same milkshake. There's a limited amount of milkshake to be had every day. And so the total amount of reward that everyone else will be getting, all other miners be getting, will go down in proportion to how much new mining you do. So if you, know, if you double the amount of existing hash rate, then instead of you know, the other miners getting 900 a day, they'll only get 450 a day, but they'll be expending the same amount of energy after the, after the, after the adjustment, right? So this is very different from any other commodity. Like if you, if you decide to mine some gold in Alaska, you don't make it the case that they mine less gold in South Africa. Like you know, the, the South African mine and the Alaskan mine are not connected so that you can either take it from the Alaska side or you can take it from the South African side. Um, but with Bitcoin, they are connected. This is just one single pool that everybody is mining, it's one pool of reward. And so when you mine, you make it more expensive for everybody else to mine per Bitcoin mine. So the simple idea is every time you add hash rate to the network, you increase the expense of every other miner to mine the same amount of Bitcoin they were mining before. And um, once you have those two pictures in your head of you're incentivizing mining by buying and holding Bitcoin on the one hand, but you're making life harder for miners on the other hand by competing with them as a miner. If you can get those two forces into equilibrium so that you're making life easier for miners by increasing their the, the value of their reward, but you're also making life harder for them by decreasing the amount of reward they get for a given input, then you'll be in a way invisible to miners. If you, if you make life better for them in one way and harder for them in another and they're in balance, then in effect, you've had no impact on their bottom line. You own, you own some Bitcoin, but from every other, every miner's point of view, it's like you don't exist. They're now mining fewer Bitcoins than they were before because you're competing with them. But the Bitcoins they do mine are worth more than they would otherwise be because of your holding. So this is a carbon neutral way of holding some Bitcoin. <laughs> Um, and it's unavailable to any other kind of investment or any other kind of kind of commodity that I know of. So back to these exist pre-existing categories. Uh, when, when regulators think about uh, Bitcoin mining's emissions, their first thought is how do we tax it or prohibit it, right? Those are the tools in their toolkit. Tax Bitcoin mining, prohibit it. Um, 
neither of those works. If you prohibit Bitcoin mining, it just goes elsewhere. Look at China. You know, they had almost half the hash rate. It's like completely fled and we're back. They, buy, they banned it. The hash rate just migrated elsewhere where it was friendlier. Um, if we tax Bitcoin mining, not that I'm opposed to a tax to Bitcoin mining, but if we tax it too heavily, the same thing will happen. Uh, and then unlike other things where you could tax their production here and then tax imports uh, from less regulated states, with Bitcoin, you can't tax it coming across the border. So it's almost a perfect foil to any attempt at regulation or taxation. It's a perfect nightmare for a carbon emissions perspective. And, and what, what we're suggesting, Andrew and I, is just the opposite. It's not in anybody's toolkit, but it's like, it's like dealing with the problem of forest fires by having controlled burns. It's like you, you have a problem of Bitcoin's emissions. What you need to do is not prevent the mining of Bitcoin. You need to mine it. You need to do it in a carbon neutral way. And if you do that, you'll make mining more expensive for everybody else. In effect, it acts almost like a tax on every other miner that you collect directly, not from them, but from the issuance of Bitcoin itself. Uh, and uh, here's, here's our simple formula, and I'll stop the rant. Here's our simple formula for how much mining you should do to offset your Bitcoin holdings, okay? Uh, we've already said that if you hold X percent of all Bitcoin, then you incentivize X percent of all mining. Our formula for how much mining you should do is X percent of all mining. You should do the same amount of mining that you incentivize. Or another way of thinking about it is mine what you're incentivizing, mine your own incentive. So if you create an incentive to do more mining, you should mine that same amount of incentive that you create. If everybody did that, the mining, the whole protocol would be mined in a carbon neutral way. If everybody mined the same percentage of all mining as they own of all Bitcoin, Bitcoin's mining would have zero emissions. Now, how much is that in practice? Well, it has to be an ongoing thing because mining is ongoing. So you need something like a subscription to mining over time. You're like, I own X percent of all Bitcoin, so I'm gonna do X percent of mining and for as long as I hold Bitcoin. Uh, well, look at the market cap of Bitcoin. It's like near a trillion dollars. And the total amount of mining is like 15 billion. Um, that's like the one and a half percent of the total market cap. So that's kind of how much you should mine. You take your total investment in Bitcoin, say it's 1% uh, uh, of the network and you do 1% of the mining, that's going to be about, on a quarterly basis, Andrew and I calculate, about a half a percent of your total investment will be spent on mining. That's it. And then at the end of the quarter, you'll see what the new ratio is and readjust. You'll get paid by your Bitcoin mining too. So it's not like you have to like pay a penalty the way you do for carbon offsets. You're mining. And so you get the rewards of that mining. And then you recalculate. So it's theoretically a profitable way to green your Bitcoin <laughs> rather than a rather than some penalty for greening your Bitcoin. Presumably at some point mining is going to be not profitable. It'll be like neutral. Um, but right now it's still profitable to mine with carbon neutral sources. Uh, yeah, with difficulty adjustment with ASICs coming online and depending on price, it may or may not be profitable. But for us, it's just like, wait a minute. Everybody could do this tiny amount of mining, like tiny as a percentage of their Bitcoin, and the entire network would be green because essentially we only have to spend 15 billion a year to green the entire network. And that's a tiny percentage of a trillion. Right? So that's the idea. That's the idea. Okay. So I've got three questions related to that. So let, let's, let's take them one, two, three here. So the first one is, um, you, you mentioned that with your proposal, we're going to add more green hashing power to the network. Okay. Well, and um, if price continues to go up, the non-green hashing has an incentive to add more non-green hashing. So what stops that from happening? Yeah, and I'm, I'm talking prior to 100% of people buying into this idea here. What's to stop the non 
green miners to just continue to add more hashing power to the network because then the number continues to go up and it's still profitable for them to add more non-green. So what stops them from doing that? I mean, nothing. Uh, this is this idea, part of, part of the appeal of this idea is that uh, it's not an impingement on anyone's freedom. You know, you have freedom mine, whatever way you like. Uh, it, as you add green hash rate, you do make, you do decrease the block reward for all miners, green and non-green, just any miner who adds the new hash rate to the network decreases the block reward. So uh, will more non-green mining come online? Yeah. Uh, how should you think about that? Well, it's not your responsibility. You have created new demand for Bitcoin mining by owning Bitcoin. How much have you created? Well, your percentage of all Bitcoin uh, creates your percentage of all mining. You mine that part green. The other parts, that's other people's responsibility. You haven't added to uh, non-green hash rate, right? And so this isn't a way yeah. of controlling other people or how they mine. Uh, they're free to do that. If everyone did it, the whole network would be green, but it would not be very Bitcoiner of me to say that there should be some kind of mandate on how, you know, right. and, and what counts as green is wildly wildly up for, for grabs. I, I, I love this movement within Bitcoin uh, to use uh, Bitcoin miners as heating elements. Uh, there's several, there's a little sub community of Bitcoiners who are hardcore into heating with Bitcoin miners and replacing large electric, electric heating elements with Bitcoin miners. The source of that electricity might be the same as what it was before. Just grid mix might be coal, but if it's replacing a heating element, it's carbon neutral from the perspective of it's not any worse than than before right and and there are many many other details about how mining is implemented i want mining to be widely distributed i want it to be free um, this is a question of how can i as a bitcoin owner um, know that i'm not contributing to emissions and i'm not because i'm mining all of the incentive uh that I'm creating. Yeah. And the rest of it's up um, to the rest I, of the world. Right. And I should have prefaced all of this by saying, first of all, pat on the back to you and Andrew for working on this, because I think long term, that's good for the network. The more that we can have uh, green mining uh, that's not destroying the planet, I think the better. So, so kudos to you two for, for working on this. So I'm any questions I have are not meant to be disparaging about, oh, this is never no. going to work. I, I mean, I hope, I, I hope I, it does. Bring on the criticism, bring it on. Yeah, no, I no criticism. I'm just, just questions like trying to understand this. Um, so a second question is when we talk about, you say we need to become a miner to the percent that our total Bitcoin holding is as a percentage of the total Bitcoin out there. Well, most people are not going to mine Bitcoin. So are you suggesting that if I own 1% of Bitcoin, that I create my own green mining network? Or are you saying, hey, you just become, you know, you contribute, you know, 1% of, of the cost of, of Bitcoin mining to an existing green mining network. So I personally am not setting up this. I'm going to another company and I'm just giving my 1% to that company. Is that what you're suggesting on that part? Yeah. Yes. Um, I, okay. I think mining is very difficult to do now for most people. Uh, and you know, uh, yeah, from experience. Yes, I, I mean, it was already, I, I mined with graphics cards and I had eight graphics cards and two machines that I built up myself. And it was already very loud and hot. And there was nothing compared to an S19. You know, most people just can't do it. Um, plus, the machines are expensive. Um, you know, it's, it's it's not easy to recommend that people mine. So we have to have a, a, a vehicle for purchasing green hash rate, um, independent of doing our own mining. And Andrew and I are working on how to do this. There's not really a great way to do it right now. You can buy uh, you can buy stock in a green miner, uh, like Bitfarms, uh, who mines with uh, hydro in Quebec. Uh, that's one way to do it. 
but it's really not clear how much hash rate you're adding to the network when you buy a given amount of stock. Um, stock is kind of a side bet. Uh, how does it actually decrease the cost of capital to bit farms when you buy their stock? Um, how much additional hash rate comes on because of that purchase is very, very hard to answer. A bond would be much better. Um, you know what I mean? They just borrow and they borrow to install a certain amount of uh, uh, capital, uh, make a certain capital investment, buy a certain amount of energy. That would be much better if you could buy a bond issuance. Actually, the Bitcoin, um, the volcano bonds in El Salvador, um, I don't know what, so 50% of that is buying Bitcoin, 50% is uh, infrastructure, but some part of that infrastructure is mining and some part of it is other stuff building Bitcoin city. If they were clear about it, then you could use this Bitcoin bonds easily to do that. Of course, that comes with its own set of complications. Like you gotta, you know, there's a certain, it comes with its own set of complications. But that would be a, what we would really like is a financial product, uh, two kinds of product. One is, green hash rate where you have um, audited uh, green defined in some particular way and then audited hash rate uh, that uh, that uh, you know that you can that you can purchase a certain amount of let's say on a quarterly subscription and the other is a way of bundling bitcoin with that so you just buy one thing which is bitcoin bundled with this half percent investment in green mining uh, one would require a little more upkeep from the uh, from the investor because they'd have to kind of like rebalance on a, on a, on a schedule, uh, rebalance their investments in green mining with their investment in Bitcoin. The other would be automatically done, but it wouldn't, it would be custodial. And, you know, our community is not, not your keys, not your coin very heavily. So it, it, they each come with their own trade-offs. Uh, but uh, I think the first place where it could be most easily adopted would be by a large institution, something like GBTC or a large ETF. We already have this carbon neutral, carbon negative ETF in Canada, uh, which basically they do the first part of our calculation pretty much identically the way we do it. Like how much of the network do you own? How much of mining are you responsible for? What portion of that mining is causing carbon emissions? How much emissions is that total? Offset that emissions. So they are offsetting their own emissions. Gemini is doing something similar. Uh, we have basically an alternative for them. Like uh, instead of buying these carbon offsets, why don't you make an investment in green mining and then you can sell your same you know, carbon neutral, carbon negative uh, product to, to investors and the work will be done behind the scenes, right? But we would also like to see a market in green hash rate and even a segmented market in green hash rate uh, where you could buy, you know, hydro wind or include nuclear or include things that are more controversial like flare gas, which I think is a very green form of mining, but not everybody agrees. Uh, you know, even, even waste coal mining in Pennsylvania, I actually think that's green mining, but probably a lot of people don't. Um, it's burning coal after all. Uh, uh, it's also cleaning up a toxic hundred year old uh, waste and it's considered green by the state of Pennsylvania. So there's, there are ways in which we could, I mean, we're just philosophers. Andrew, Andrew and I are just philosophers, uh, but we're, we're pointing the way for a, a category that doesn't yet exist, which is a, we call it a green co-investment instrument, a GCI. And we want the finance people to create the GCIs. <laughs> this, is, this is just, you know, a way of, of uh, I mean, some of it's legal, right? Selling hash rate has been done for a long time in a cloud in cloud mining contracts those have mostly been scammy uh they also look to me like securities i mean you are promising future hash rate for a current payment so i'm sure the legal situation is dicey there for selling that to retail right one easy thing to do would be to tokenize it um binance has tokenized hash rate on the binance smart chain do they have a mining pool and you buy basically a percentage of that mining pool's hash rate and you get the Bitcoin rewards from it. Uh, perfect, easy. And then you can trade that hash rate in this liquid market for, uh, for their mining tokens. Andrew and I obviously being Bitcoiners, we're not gonna come up with a token. We're, we decided very early on, we could easily come up with a token.
which is a GCI token, which would green your Bitcoin. Um, and we could run it on some other, you know, some other chain uh, or even do it on liquid. Uh, we decided against the token offering because it's just so scammy. We would like something that runs entirely on Bitcoin. Uh, yeah, I've looked into, I've thought a lot about, can I do it with discrete log contracts? Um, but that's, that's all downstream of this upstream question we had, which is how do you invest in Bitcoin in a carbon neutral way without offsets, simply by mining? And that we have a really hard job just selling that. I mean, you, you heard how much difficulty I had just explaining it here, right? And I've been thinking about it for a long time. I need the storytelling, right? I need the narrators uh, to tell this story because it's also unintuitive, right? It, it, it's like, it, you know, this is one of the coolest ideas I've ever had. <laughs> and I can't actually communicate it. <laughs> well, I think I you are. Actually and communicate. I think you are. And I think you've just given us all a call to action here. And by putting this out there, you mentioned that you're like, you and Andrew are pointing the way. You've got this idea, you're pointing the way. And now by getting this out there, hopefully we can get more people that can come along and say, oh, well, I can do this piece and I can do that piece and I can write stories about it and, and see where this goes. And I think that's one of the things that the Bitcoin community is so good about is that we, one we, person puts something out there yeah. and other people pick up on it and they add to it. It's like standing on the shoulder of giants. You know, that, that's how progress is we made. Would, we would love to hear from people. I'm at the Trocro on Twitter. Um, and and uh, it, particularly the people we'd like to hear from are uh, people who sell Bitcoin exchanges, uh, Miners, green, especially green miners who are looking to sell maybe not just their Bitcoins, uh, but hash rate. It's crucial for us that we don't distinguish between greenly mined Bitcoins and other Bitcoin. All Bitcoin are fungible. So we're not going to buy green Bitcoin, but we are interested in purchasing green hash rate. Uh, hash rate is not fungible for us. Bitcoin is fungible for us, right? We would love to hear from, from you. I mean, I, I consulted with an economist early, early on in this. And he said, you know, it's a cool idea. You need to decide what you want out of it. Do you want to publish it in academic journals? Do you want, uh, do you want to get rich? Do you want to offer a product and monetize the idea? Do you want to see it happen? Do you want to see it adopted? Because he's like, you need to choose between these three because it'll dictate what you do next. And I had to pause for a second because I hadn't clearly distinguished those in my mind, but I was like, make it happen. That's the one, you know, I want to, I want to see it actually happen. I wanted to see it go from an idea to a reality. I mean, it's the most impressive thing that Satoshi did, not just come up with an idea uh, uh, about what money could be and publish it in a journal. He, he made it happen. He bootstrapped it into code and then to a community, right? So this is an idea, I mean, I'd love to see it happen uh, because I, I think it, it solves kind of two problems simultaneously if it works. The one is it unleashes like $17 trillion in the US of capital that's governed by ESG frameworks. I mean, I think this is a way to go to an ESG board and say, you know, this thing we've heard is, is environmentally destructive. We can actually invest in it in, uh, in a way that's carbon neutral. And I'd be happy to make that argument to any ESG board. Um, and that's, that's a third of US capital, right? That's $17 trillion. That's an incredible amount of money. And that would make NGU big time uh, if some percentage of that flows into Bitcoin, right? And the other side, uh, the side that I originally thought about <laughs> and I'm still thinking about is Bitcoin's actual emissions. What does the network look like in the future? And to some extent, I think Bitcoin is already on a path to, uh, to revolutionizing the grid and energy production. And many Bitcoiners have spoken to this, but it uses waste energy, it uses curtailed energy, it uses renewable energy because it's cheap. It, it incentivizes the build out of renewable energy, right? Bitcoin's power profile is not the gloom and doom that it's painted out to be. It's already headed in the right direction, but I would like to see it accelerated in that direction. And so th this idea like solves two problems at once for me. 
and the one is, you know, it was kind of goes back to the political smearing of Bitcoin as belonging to a certain tribe. I also think a big part of that is its energy footprint, uh, its carbon footprint, right? And I think that that narrative is a hard one to tackle, but this is part of how you tackle that narrative. No, we're investing in Bitcoin in a carbon neutral way. Uh, and breaking down the kind of cognitive barriers that people have to Bitcoin. And then the other side is like shaping the Bitcoin network in a way that we, uh, that we would like to see it go, uh, pushing it even, even, even further towards sustainability and accelerating the adoption of sustainable energy production. And yeah, if you want to contact uh, me and Andrew, anyone who's listening, please do so, especially if you have the ability to help us. And, and uh, we're not planning on monetizing it, but it's going to be monetized by someone. If someone can successfully sell this product and do the narrative, it's a tremendous amount of money to be made. I mean, that's 17 trillion. <laughs> if some portion of that flows into Bitcoin through this product, then however many basis points you're taking, it's going to be way more than my socks are worth now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> It's going to be a tremendous amount of money. That's not my role, but that could be yours. And I'm happy to consult on how that product could go because I've spent a lot of time thinking about it. So has Andrew. Andrew isn't here. You've, you've interviewed him before. Andrew has been, right. um, I should just say, uh, I mean, I had the germ of the idea and ran it by Andrew very early on. And Andrew was like, can I get on board? And I was like, absolutely. And that was the best decision. It never would have gone anywhere without him. He's a fantastic critic, co-author, builder, a, a positive, uh, deep thinking person. And uh, and we're we're not, yeah, we're gonna work on this thing collectively together for the foreseeable future. Absolutely. Yeah, and I have had Andrew on the podcast, so you can go back in an earlier episode and listen to that. So, so two things here, and then we're going to be wrapping up. Um, uh, one is, I said I got a third question, so I want to get to that. Uh, but also, you guys have a paper here too. So, is that paper public yet, or public? No? Yes, yeah, public. Okay, it's, and uh, and and I'll I'll link to it on the website stevesandusky.com. But is there another way for folks to get access to the paper too? Yeah, you can also go to the Resistance Money website, which lists all of, I'm not a member of Resistance Money, but I'm like Resistance Money adjacent. Uh, <laughs> Resistance, Money, Resistance Money is uh, Andrew Bailey, Bradley Rattler, and Craig Warmke, uh, three philosophers who, who, who write prolifically about Bitcoin and are currently working on a book. And um, all of their work on Bitcoin is published uh, at that site, Resistance, I think it's Resistance money.com uh, and and so is this paper yeah this white Excellent. paper yeah and i've had all three of them on the podcast so if you love uh talking about philosophy and bitcoin uh, definitely uh, check out those episodes well the third question i had was you said that we need to allocate roughly half a percent per quarter of what our you know the value of our bitcoin holding if i understood that correctly but then you said some of that gets offset by the mining rewards. So do you have a sense for if I'm contributing a half a percent per quarter, how much of that is coming back to me in, in the form of Bitcoin? Is it like half of it would be offset? Is it 90%, is it 10% or is it just gonna vary over time? Um, well, different mining operations have different profitability so it's going to vary with how profitable the mining operation is. But to the extent that it's profitable, it's none of those numbers you mentioned. It's all over 100%. So at the end of the quarter, you're going to get back whatever your input mined, whatever that hash rate mined in Bitcoin. So if uh, it's going to depend on Bitcoin price too, right? It's like if Bitcoin's price went up, then you'll make a lot of money. If Bitcoin's price dove, you might lose money, even if you were better off than holding Bitcoin for the same period, you might still lose money. Uh, so it's impossible to say what that is. I think, uh, here's the point. It's just an investment in green mining. So it, it, it's, the, it's the same as if you, uh, and, and yeah, every, every green miner has a different pro profitability kind of profile and expectation. Um, but uh, 
look at the cost of mining a Bitcoin to, to start with. How much does it cost somebody to mine a Bitcoin right now? Um, and I've heard a lot of different numbers from the industry, but uh, something like around $10,000 is not ridiculous. These large hydro facilities, uh, this will get more expensive because there's a limited number of hydro facilities in the world, right? But they're paying like one cent a kilowatt hour and they already have tons of miners. So they're not paying anything new on the CapEx side. Uh, so they're probably mining for much less, maybe even six or $7,000 a coin. And then the coin's worth, I don't know what it's worth today. I don't check price. I didn't check price today. Say, I don't know, let's say $50,000. Um, so, you, you know, that's tremendously profitable. Of course, you're not going to get all that profit. Everybody's going to take a cut along the way. Whatever we're proposing is going to take a cut. The miner's going to take a cut. There's a risk involved in being a miner. Uh, and, and part of selling hash rate to miners or selling to miners, the idea that they should sell hash rate rather than Bitcoin is that if you buy Bitcoin from a miner, in a sense, they've taken the risk on, on the price of Bitcoin and they get the reward. Whereas if they sell hash rate, uh, they're taking less risk, but they'll get less reward. And you, the buyer of hash rate, will be, will be taking that same risk now and getting more of the reward. So you have to convince miners in order to sell hash rate they're, they're loving life right now. They're all stacking their Bitcoin. They're not uh, reselling their Bitcoin on the, on the market. Their cost to mine is like sub $10,000. They're, they're mining $50,000 Bitcoin. They're going to be reluctant to sell hash rate. So, so some of the answer to your question is like, well, how much are miners willing to part with hash rate for? How do they trade off the guaranteed buyer at the front end buying hash rate over a given period versus the payoff of getting that Bitcoin on the other end? And so I can't really predict that market. It's like a worldwide market in green hash rate versus Bitcoin. Um, but I, all I can say is, uh, all I can say is, uh, it, it, it shouldn't be too expensive because uh, you could always set up your own mining facility and mine green yourself and sell hash rate to people who are willing to buy it if there's demand from this product, and it. it can't really be a lot more expensive than that. Um, so uh, yeah, I, it's a hand wavy answer, yeah. but but I think I think yeah. in general, what's cool about it is like, what's the penalty for uh, what's the penalty for buying this co-investment? It should be a negative penalty, as long as Bitcoin mining is profitable. It should be negative. Right. Yeah, and I think another benefit is that as this would likely be a net increase in hash power to the network, it's going to strengthen the network over time. So you're really doing yourself a favor too by increasing, you know, that that the the hashing uh, power, which is going to continue to secure the network. So it's it's really in your best interest. So yeah, yeah, uh, actually well, one last thing, you know, uh, Andrew yeah. and I wrote a paper called Mine Your Values in Coindesk. And really the I this idea is almost like an instance of that thesis. Our thesis there was that as a Bitcoin holder, you are a participant in the Bitcoin community and network. You shape its future. So if you run a node, for instance, you can decide to run the core software rather than some fork. And you verify um, all transactions. But also you can decide to mine in the way that you want mining to happen. It's not just that you can mine with green hash rate, but you can mine in a way that doesn't censor based on past transactions that preserves the fungibility of uh, Bitcoin, right? That doesn't, uh, like when Marathon tried to censor transactions or whatever uh, blacklist addresses, like you don't participate in that. So you can think about this kind of rule of thumb of if you have X percent of Bitcoin, do X percent of mining, much more generally than the environment. That's just kind of one aspect of mining you are responsible for the network that you participate in. The mining is a component of that. If you wanna take responsibility for the future of the network, you should do so, how much? Well, rule of thumb, the same percentage of all mining as the percentage of all Bitcoin you own. If everybody did that, then the mining sort of distribution of miners would mirror the distribution of owners. Right. So then rather than kind of relying on 
rather than the owners relying on this separate force, which is like a bunch of miners who are different from us, we would be the miners and we wouldn't be relying on anything outside of ourselves. So our incentives and the miners' incentives would be aligned. You wouldn't have this like miners fighting versus holders. Miners would be the holders if everybody followed this formula, right? So the formula is kind of like a, almost like a model of governance and democratic citizenship or something. Like how much should you do to bring about the kind of Bitcoin future that you desire? Right, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a great concept. I'm glad we're able to spend some time talking about it here. And as we, we said a minute ago, a bit of a call to arms here. So anyone that likes this idea, uh, definitely reach out to, to Troy and Andrew. And uh, we're going to have to wrap here. Troy, this has yeah. been fantastic. <laughs> we'll have to get you back great. on again. But uh, one more time, tell me how how can people connect with you? I know you're active on Twitter. Definitely encourage folks to to get with you on Twitter. So what's your your Twitter handle again? Yeah, my Twitter Twitter handle, which be, which started as a joke many many years ago, and I never thought I would actually use it, is at the tro crow uh yeah it, it, at the tro crow the, that's the best and there's no it. there's no w on that crow though is there <laughs> no 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 w yeah uh at yeah. the, the tro crow, awesome. C-R-O, cro yeah all right great yeah thanks for well, fantastic me now, steve uh, yeah, appreciate thank you. it yeah i i think i think i've covered pretty much everything i know about bitcoin and everything else <laughs> Oh, no. This is a great conversation. Really enjoyed it. It has been great. So appreciate it. Thank you.